You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. And welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast for our first ever video episode, partnered by our friends here at Kill Cliff. And we want to welcome everybody into this new version of the Hazard Ground. If you're watching us here on our YouTube channel and other platforms, including killcliff.com, we certainly appreciate you guys joining us in this new venture and being part of this whole thing. Before we get to the guests coming up on this week's show, we certainly just want to once again say thank you to everybody who's part of the Hazard Ground community. And certainly as we go forward in this new venture uh, where we're doing video for each episode going forward, uh, we hope you, you guys are part of the show more and more. So uh, joining us this week on this special episode is two actual guests. Both of them are former Air Force A-10 pilots who have over 50 years of combined service and 15 tours overseas. We're going to focus on the invasion of Iraq and their roles in it, which they provided close air support to troops on the ground and were both awarded the Silver Star for their actions. Joining us is retired Colonel Tim Dong Strasberger and retired Lieutenant Colonel Greg Billy Bob Thornton. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks very much, Mark. Billy Bob and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to contribute. Yeah, it's an honor to be on the show. Thanks. Yeah, and listen, a great first episode to have you both on here. It's not often we do dual guests on one show, but given what we're doing here in this episode, I think it works out really, really well. And so, uh, as I said, 50 years of service, a lot of combat tours throughout the world. But whenever it comes to Air Force pilots, the first question everybody always asks, and we have to answer first before we start with your military career, is how did you get your call sign nickname? So, Tim, you go first. How do you end up with a name like Donk? So that's uh, very easy. Uh, In my first fighter squadron, which was the 356 Tactical Fighter Squadron at Myrtle Beach Air Force Base in South Carolina, uh, at the time, uh, the movie... Crocodile Dundee uh, was rather popular, or at least it had been popular in recent memory. And um, I had a buddy of mine who thought I looked remarkably like the character Donk in uh, that particular movie. And uh, if you've ever seen that movie, um, there is a striking resemblance between me and that character, except for the fact that I think I've got better teeth. So that's how I got my call sign. All right. Well, Greg, uh, I, I know the last name, so I, I assume that Billy Bob is involved in there somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Um, I I did pilot training with the Navy for the first half and then went over back to the Air Force to fly jets. Uh, and the first day I walk into my flight commander's office and he looks at me and he looks at my last name. And he's like, you're Billy Bob. And I'm like, who's Billy Bob? And he's like, have you seen Sling Blade? <laughs> And I'm like, nope, I haven't seen Sling Blade. So he says, go watch the movie Sling Blade. And so I went went home and watched the movie Sling Blade. And I go, man, first impression, is that what I get? And so, <laughs> you know, that's where they started calling me Billy Bob. And then uh, when you're really going to get your first name at your first fighter squadron, well, our squadron was uh, deploying at the time or gearing up to deploy. And so I flew... Uh, like uh, I flew my MQT uh, syllabus and check ride and, and two sorties later, I deployed to Southern watch. So I hadn't officially been, been named. And the rule in the A-10 community is if you've flown in, in a combat sortie with your call sign, then you get to keep it. And so they had been calling me Billy Bob the whole time. And now I'd flown in combat with it. So I get back to the squadron and we're having our naming and they're like, well, you've kind of met the ROE and I guess I didn't mess enough things up for them to rechange it. So that's how I got my call sign, Billy Bob. Some of our younger audience and at least people of my generation, when they hear Billy Bob, they think of varsity blues and Billy Bob, yeah. big bad offense. So he, he's no longer with us. May he rest in peace. But you know, that's usually what some of the younger generation will go with, although the actor Billy Bob Thornton, never a, uh, never a bad second choice. So, uh, right. 
because we have both of you here and we want to hear both of your individual stories. And oh, by the way, for fans of the Hazard Ground, it's interesting to note that that both Donk and Billy Bob story also interact with a previous guest, Kim Campbell, who is episode 95, uh, as you guys all sort of fought, to get, fought together in this same initial invasion of Iraq. So just some frame of reference. Uh, and Kim was an incredible pilot whose you know, plane got shot all to hell. Uh, and it was amazing that she even landed and survived the thing while she provided, again, close air support. So uh, just some frame of reference. But let's start with you, Donk, and, and how and why did your military career start? Uh, okay, so uh, I think that's pretty easy, Mark. Uh, I grew up the son of a uh, World War II gyrene, South Pacific Marine, uh, and uh, he was part of a B-25J squadron uh, in the New Hebrides group. I had an older brother who aspired uh, and ultimately became a uh, F-15 pilot in the United States Air Force. Uh, and flying is something that, uh, you know, ever since I listened to the stories of, uh, of my father and his experiences, although he didn't, he didn't describe them in great detail as, as many members of the great generation, uh, the greatest generation chose not to do. Uh, I was still very much enamored with it. My father was and is my hero. Uh, and that is the reason why uh, I joined the United States Air Force. There was a point in time when I was 18 years old and he caught me walking out of the house uh, in uh, a suit on a Saturday morning, ready to go to the United States Marine Corps recruiter and join the Corps. Uh, he uh, asked me if I would come back in the house and have a cup of coffee with him. And I said, sure. And uh, the next thing I know, uh, uh, I'm going to see an Air Force recruiter uh, as opposed to a U.S. Marine Corps recruiter. And uh, then, you know, I started to pursue my education. I did ROTC and I got my commission as a second lieutenant out of Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1984. Wow. And then uh, what, 30 years later, it's, uh, it was time to hang it up. Uh, so Billy Bob, how about you? Where'd you start? Well, I enlisted in the Air Force right out of high school. So after the uh, after summer, out, after graduating high school, I enlisted and um, did nine years enlisted before I switched over and became an officer. Um, my influence was really, I joined for college money. Uh, quite frankly, um, I did have my grandfather who was in World War II and the Korean War. Uh, and then my dad was uh, Air Force Reserve during Vietnam. So, but I never saw them in uniform. Um, I don't, we didn't talk about it a lot. Um, we lived close to Chinute, the old Chinute Air Force Base. Um, so I, it wasn't just pushed on me, but it was kind of the only option that I had after high school that I thought was uh, the best for me. So that's the route I went. Well, in fairness, you know, I've told it several times. I mean, that's how I got here. You know, it was a in, in the pre-9-11 world, yeah. uh, you signed up for an ROTC scholarship just to pay for college. I mean, that was really that's what right. it was for. It was a means to an end. Uh, and for me, almost 22 years later, I'm still sitting here. So uh, I think that there's a lot of us in the pre-9-11 world who did that. And, yeah. uh, you know, at that point in time, I don't know if it was the same for you, Billy Bob, or not. But you know, it was almost, almost like one of those things people viewed it as like, well, why can't you get a real job? You know, it was one of those things where people looked at it and they were really almost scoffing at the idea of going to the military because in the 90s, there was no reason to join. The Clinton administration was downsizing the active force to its lowest level since pre-World War II. And, and it just it was there were so many other things available to people back then. Yeah, I was lucky enough that I came in during the Reagan era in 88. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, things were things were big and it just went uh, got smaller ever since, I think. Um but uh, for me, it was just I needed to go grow up. And my first assignment was um, overseas. So, you know, it was it was a real uh, kick in the jump to have me wake up and, and grow up. And and so it was good for me. All right. So let's start. Uh, let's go back to you, Donk, and talk a little bit more about the beginning part of your career, because I know we're here to focus on Iraq, but you actually were part of a lot of other previous major combat engagements, including Desert Storm and, and Somalia. So, um, you know, I, 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 without getting too specific, just, you know, where, where, how does all that come about for you? Like, where does, 
you know, your first taste of combat come? Is it Desert Storm? No. So actually, um, it's it's Billy Bob that's got the experience in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and in Somalia. I got a really. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a forty-five second quick story about Desert Storm for me. So at the time, uh, once again, I was at Myrtle Beach. I was a two ship flight lead, um, and so I, I, I kind of felt like I was at the, the top of my game. And we were in a situation where we had three A ten squadrons at Myrtle Beach. Two out of the three of those squadrons uh, were going to deploy, and one would not. Uh, and we were characterized as a dependent fighter squadron. So we were the Bravo squadron. There was an Alpha, a Bravo, and a Charlie. The Alpha was an independent squadron and could go anywhere they needed to by themselves and be self-contained and self-sufficient. As the dependent Bravo squadron, we had to either fall in on the Alpha squadron or the Charlie squadron. Uh, for maintenance activity and things like that. And uh, unfortunately, what ended up happening was we, we were designated to deploy. And then about five days prior to deployment to Saudi Arabia, uh, we got changed out with Charlie Squadron. So I sat Desert Storm, uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm out. And I can tell you that... Uh, I was a pretty disgruntled young man at that point in time because uh, that opportunity to deploy to combat was kind of, uh, um, you know, snatched from my grasp, if you will. And so I didn't get the opportunity to fly in combat for the first time until after 9-11. Um, but, uh, yeah, and uh, there's a little bit of a funny story there. Um, I guess I made uh, my bride, Teresa, pretty miserable. Uh, while I was, uh, while I was not deployed in my, my compatriots were, and, uh, she ended up writing a, a letter to the person that we call the combined force air component commander, uh, who at the time was Lieutenant General, uh, Chuck Horner. And, uh, she talked to him about how I needed to deploy and I needed to join my compatriots and get out of her hair. And, uh, interestingly enough, I didn't know that she had written that note uh, until I got home from work one day and I saw the personal stationery of a three-star general sitting on the top of the laundry machine. And he had taken the opportunity to write her back. And uh, he was pretty descriptive in how I needed to stay at home and be prepared and do my duty back in the United States as opposed to Saudi Arabia. So Pretty interesting that I found that out months after my wife had written that letter. Needless yeah. to say, my squadron commander and my wing commander were pretty mortified. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, credit for the initiative, I suppose, right? Like at this point in time, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's all you can tell her. Take, good initiative, bad execution. Uh, describes <laughs> 20 of the 22 years of my career. So um, neither here nor there. <laughs> right. Um, but Billy Bob, your, your experience, uh, and apologies for confusing the two of you before, um, but you know, your experience leading up to uh, Iraq involved a, a lot of other engagements, obviously. Well, yeah, when I was enlisted and I got back from overseas, I was stationed in a C-130 squadron and we deployed um, early uh, in the spring of 91. You know, after most of the major conflict had ended, but we deployed to Dahran, Saudi Arabia and and um, you know, I got my first taste of really watching fighters uh, over in my my first assignment at Clark Air Base in the Philippines, watching the F-4s and then uh, Desert Storm, the C-130 squadron that we that I was assigned to. We worked right at the end of the runway and no kidding. Those guys, the jets would be taken off right over our head. And it was just awe inspiring and kind of kind of placed a bug in me. I didn't really I still didn't realize that, you know, that was an opportunity for me. Um, but leaving Desert Storm, uh, also went to uh, Mombasa, Kenya for the Mogadishu, uh, the Somalia thing, and uh, was there for about four months. Um, and that's when, uh, same squadron, same C-130 squadron as a maintainer. And uh, I got to ride on a mission with one of those, uh, with those guys. And we flew into Mogadishu, and then we flew into a couple of outlying fields and sitting on the flight deck as those guys are coming in on their approaches 
uh, it just kind of was like, this is what I want to do if I could ever do this. So I started talking to a couple of the pilots and I said, how do you do that? And they just said, Hey, you know, get your degree, apply to officer training school and go. And I'm like, okay. And, and that's kind of what start the, tra- started the train. I mean, I was already working for my college degree, but then it was, then it was like, okay, don't just get a degree, get a degree to go to officer training school, to go to pilot training. And that's the path I took. All right, Donk, take me through how you ended up as a actual A-10 pilot, because I know that there is some choices involved and, you know, you get to choose your aircraft, you have to go to certain schooling or get chosen for it. So, you know, for the listening audience, how do you end up uh, not behind the wheel, but behind the controls of a right. uh, of an A-10? So uh, I, I took a little bit of a circuitous path, Mark. Um, as I was graduating from ROTC at Howard, I took my pre-commissioning physical and um, they thought that I had a problem with my eyesight. And what they did was, is they took my pilot slot away from me and they offered me a slot as a navigator. And, you know, for me, it was all about uh, earning my commission. It was about, you know, flying airplanes and it was about serving my country. And uh, so, whether I did that in capacity as a pilot or as a navigator, uh, although the preference would have been as a pilot, uh, I certainly jumped on the opportunity to become a navigator. And so uh, I went to nav school at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento, California. And uh, then I ended up getting um, B-52 H models out of there. And uh, I went to K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I did about two and a half years as a navigator there. And uh, through the course of that time, I still had the opportunity to apply to go to pilot training, which I did. It took me three tries. Finally, on my last opportunity, I got picked up to go to pilot training. I went to Williams Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona, Chandler, Arizona, actually, and uh, graduated from there. I, I got to be honest with you, the A-10 uh, was not my first choice at that point in time. Uh, the Strike Eagle, the F-15E model, uh, was just coming online. At least that's how I remember it. And uh, I thought it would be pretty awesome to, to fly that machine. Uh, but as it was, as fate would have it, I ended up in uh, the mighty Warthog, and, uh, you know, as they say, the rest is history. That is uh, an incredible airplane with an incredible mission. Uh, you know, Billy Bob and I, unlike most um, Air Force pilots, we spent our entire professional lives uh, dedicated to men and women on the ground. Uh, and it is an absolutely incredible experience that we've had. And I wouldn't trade any. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, you bring that up, and I want to get more into that in a moment, but I do want to hear um, Billy Bob's story. But just sort of anecdotally, you know, in, in every time I talk to a pilot, and whether it's Army or it's Air Force, you know, um, it, it's it's a – what's the right word? I don't want to say weird. It, it's a unique appreciation that you guys have for the people on the ground. And, and, and I say that because you've never met these people. You've never served with them. You, you've never trained with them. You've never done anything with them. But essentially, their life is in your hands. And that is a responsibility that you guys have to take incredibly seriously. Um, and mm-hmm. every pilot I ever talked to, that's all they ever gauge their level of success on, really, uh, in any given mission, any given sortie is, did the people on the ground survive? Because that's obviously the measuring stick and why you're in the air and in the, in, in the cockpit. Yeah, no, I, Mark, you, you, you are 100% correct. And I think... Uh, it is the measure of success and, you know, not, not, uh, not to get, uh, you know, too serious about things too early, but, you know, for example, on this particular mission that we're going to describe, we know that, uh, everybody didn't, um, didn't make it. Right. And so you always reflect, um, and, and sometimes it's minutes thereafter. Sometimes it's days, sometimes it's months. And, 
sometimes it even occurs to me now where you reflect on things and you wonder whether or not there was something more that you could have done to preserve life, limb, and eyesight, you know, of our brothers and sisters on the ground. Um, and, 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 and there is the knowledge that there are times when you are not necessarily in a position to affect the outcome of, of events on the battlefield the way that you would prefer. Um, but as long as you can look yourself in the mirror when you come back home and you know that you've done everything that you could on that particular sortie uh, to affect uh, you know, those men and women and their families, um, then that needs to be satisfaction enough, even when sometimes um, you're not entirely successful. Billy Bob, if you'd want to, you know, comment on that, but also again, how you got behind uh, uh, the the controls of an A10, I'd like to hear both parts. Sure. Uh, let's start off with the first part, or, or what Doc was talking about. Um, and you mentioned uh, that, yeah, it is all about the guy on the ground, and we don't know them. Um, A10 guys are a little bit different than that. Um, I'm a brand new lieutenant in the 75th Fighter Squadron at Pope Air Force Base, and my wartime tasking was not as an A-10 pilot. My wartime tasking was to be a battalion air liaison officer with 369 armor out of Fort Stewart, so speed and power to those guys. Uh, and I did two NTC tours out with those guys prepping. So that's the unique part about the A-10 guys is we go out to the field we, you know, camp for 19 days or or more at a time. Uh, we're, we're, you know, if you're in an infantry, infantry unit or armor unit, you're moving with these guys, uh, you know, doing all the things that they do and you're getting to know them. And in this unique uh, situation that we're about to talk about, we knew one of the guys because he was a lieutenant in our squadron, uh, John Coke Bloker. And so we, we'll talk about the whole introduction, but not only did we know him personally, but, you know, as an A-10 guy, I had, I knew that now that I knew that it was Coke and he was assigned to 269 armor, you know, I kind of had this feeling like I know, I kind of know the guys on the ground. I, I had been to two NTCs with, with that brigade. Uh, and so, yeah, we kind of know, and there's a, there used to be an old um, sign in one of the A-10 squadrons at uh, Kuwait that said, if the enemy tank commander's eating in your chow hall, you lost the war. And so, you know, it's all, it is all about supporting the guy on the ground because you may not have a runway to come back to if you, if you fail. And, and yeah. so that's kind of what we, whew, that was kind of, that was one of my first indications. And then I think Don kind of started this, but it could, it could have been someone else, but, uh, he really emphasized it and he hung a sign up in, in Afghanistan that said the mission is an 18 year old with a rifle in his hand. And, and this squadron kind of took on that motto. And I think the whole A-10 community kind of, kind of, uh, jumped on that as well. And so, uh, we ingrained that into our hearts and, and that's what we live for. And so, uh, getting into the A-10 uh, the second part of your question was, so, you know, did nine years in the Air Force and then finally get the opportunity to become an officer and go fly. So, like I said, the first part of pilot training was with the Navy. And, you know, I had been in C-130s and I almost went C-130s uh, because I could continue that training with the Navy. And I said, hey, you only get one shot in your life to be a fighter pilot. Take it. Uh, and so I did. And so I go to Vance Air Force Base and, you know, luckily it was my first choice. Uh, not everybody wanted the A-10, so I got it because <laughs> I definitely was not the number one student in my class. And uh, and that's it. You know, went got to go fly A-10s. Uh, and again, the first my first squadron was the 75th Fighter Squadron and got there in um, 99 and then you know, 9-11 happened. So it, it's a good thing that 18 year old, a rifle didn't know you were a C student, right? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I, I think you just, you might've moved my GPA up a little bit, but that's all right. 
So, all right. Uh, you mentioned 9 11. Uh, where, are, where are both you guys on 9 11? Um, Billy Bob, go ahead. Uh, we're both at Pope Air Force oh, Base okay. in North Carolina, right outside of Fort Bragg. Uh, we, our, our relationship started, I want to say, and Don can correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say at about 2000 and well, it had been 2000, I think is when he got there. So about a year prior to 9-11, uh, when he PCS'd into our squadron. And uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, Don, you and our commander, Bino Turner, lived off base. And I lived on base. And uh, we were night flying that week. So that means we come in to work late, around noon or something like that. And I was sitting, uh, I was awake eating breakfast when the airplane hit the first tower. And I was talking to my mom and then the airplane hit the second tower. And then I hung up and I told her I had to go to work. And I was on my way into the squadron without even being recalled and Bino was calling me and he's like, Hey, you live on base. And I said, boss, I'm on my way to work. He's like, start the recall. And so we started the recall uh, and put airplanes on alert. I, I don't think we launched any that day, but um, that's where, that's where we were on nine 11. Donk. Yeah, you bet brother. Um, so uh, Teresa and I, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, um, I had taken a day to leave uh, on that particular day. And so the very first thing that I did was uh, we wanted to go on base. Uh, and I was sitting in the barber chair at the uh, Officers Club barbershop uh, with Teresa, uh, getting uh, my standard flat top maintenance. And uh, as Billy Bob described, you know, we were watching TV and we saw the cut to the news and, uh, you know, clearly we saw the first airplane hit uh, the first tower. And, you know, I, I struggled with that, frankly, you know, as a pilot myself, I kind of wondered, you know, what what could happen in the cockpit of that airplane that would be so catastrophic that would prevent the, the air crew uh, from avoiding one of the twin towers on a clear VFR day. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, as you ponder that and you think about, you know, lost lives and the tragedy that was associated with that, not only for the people on the airplane, but certainly the people in the tower, uh, you know, then we see the second airplane hit. And uh, it, as soon as that happened, you know, Teresa and I kind of made eye contact with each other and, um, as she is prone to be, she is very stoic. Uh, and I asked the barber if he could finish up real quick, and that's what he did. And she and I got in the car, and we went right back to the squadron. And of course, uh, you know, that's when we picked up uh, with the recall of the rest of our guys, the recall of our maintainers and our life support techs, and our uh, our, our administrative folks, uh, and then you know, starting to you know put airplanes on alert. Um, it, it, with, with really not knowing exactly what our intent would yeah. be, but wanting to be prepared just in case, uh, more specifically with, uh, air to air weaponry. So for the A-10, you know, you've got the capability for two, uh, in nine sidewinders, uh, which are heat seeking, uh, air to air missiles. Uh, and then you've got the gun. Um, and so that's what we did as Billy Bob described. Now, I, I get again the initial invasion of Iraq. You're there, but anything happening for either one of you in the initial invasion of Afghanistan? You want to take that, Billy Bob? Uh, absolutely, sure. Um, so, our squadron was uh, we were already leaning forward pretty good. I think we were spinning up to deploy. Uh, we were right after 9-11 happened, we, I think we went out to Nellis Air Force Base for, uh, to support the NTC and maybe a red flag. And, uh, and then when we got home, um, we quickly got orders to deploy to 
uh, Bagram, Afghanistan. Our sister squadron, the 74th Fighter Squadron, was actually the first in country and kind of kind of got the airplanes there and started the bare bones of the base. And then we came in uh, and really kind of set it up after, you know, from their initial uh, start. So in, I want to say it was late summer of 02 that uh, we went over to, or the squadron went to Afghanistan. I actually was home. My wife was having our third child, uh, but as soon as we had that child, I got the call from Donk and, and Bino and said, hey, you DCMJ and, and four other people need to bring six more airplanes over because we're setting up Bagram. And so I kind of showed up to Kuwait, but eventually it was um, it was August of 02 when I went to Bagram and then Donk was Donk was running the thing, was running ops in Bagram and I came over and and uh, that's we flew our first combat sortie together actually in Afghanistan. Oh wow! Um, so yeah. Hey, hey, and Mark, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna no, go amplify a little bit there uh, because you know, as as Billy Bob was talking, I was reminded of the fact that you know he was back home with Sally uh, as their youngest son uh, Nathan was born and. Um, we actually had deployed on a tasking to Kuwait. That's why Billy Bob makes mention of the fact that uh, he and a couple of teammates had to bring over six additional jets because at the time, um, the 74th Fighter Squadron, which was our sister squadron, as Billy Bob made mention, uh, they were forward deployed, I think, with some reserve and quite possibly Air National Guard jets. Uh, into Bagram. That was the first footprint. And what we were doing was we were doing the combat search and rescue mission, which was a legacy mission from Southern Watch uh, when when the 9-11 attacks, when they took place, that's what the 74th was doing. So the 74th forward deploys into Bagram. And then what happens is, is we deploy from the States into Kuwait to backfill them and then everything else that Billy Bob describes in terms of the in terms of the timing and our push into Iraq to replace the 74th and some of these um, reserve units that were there uh, that took place in the summer of, of 02. And, and to Billy Bob's point, um, and I and I do think it's an important point because it it will figure um, quite heavily in the story from 6 April 2003 over Baghdad is the fact that we were designated as combat pairs and we flew together and, you know, you, you kind of get to a point where you almost don't even have to talk to each other about what your expectations are uh, because it becomes intuitive. It becomes natural and, 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 and you almost know what each other are going to do or intending to do, um, you know, without any communication between the two of you. So that started that combat pairing and that relationship and that bond, uh, you know, in the air between me and Billy Bob that actually started in Afghanistan. That's pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's not often that you get a chance to, you know, know somebody in this industry, in this field for as long as you guys have known each other. But the fact that you've had so many similar experiences and have been together for so long is really uncommon just because, you know, look, you go to the, where the needs of the military are, where the needs of the Air Force are, right? And uh, how often, several hundred A-10 pilots across the entire Air Force, whatever it may be, you know, they pitch you guys where they need you at certain times. It's just really sort of serendipity that, you know, you guys ended up staying together for a better part of your careers, or at least during the most critical parts of your careers. You know, our being us being combat paired, and it, it, he said it started in Afghanistan. I, I'll say it started when we first met because we had such a close working relationship in the squadron at Pope. He he was he came in as this fire breathing brand new lieutenant colonel, and I just pinned on captain. And uh, we worked closely on several projects, including when he moved up to be the director of ops, and I'm running the chief of scheduling. Uh, we worked daily. I had to get his signature on you know, the approval of the schedule and, and, and we 
you know, I didn't agree with everything he wanted to do. He didn't agree with everything I wanted to do. And, and we started that relationship outside of the airplane actually. And, uh, that bond, um, just working so closely, I, you know, he, he's Donk has a reputation. He's, he's highly respected. Uh, and, and he's easy, he's easy to, uh, to be around. He's easy to, he's easy to kid. He's, he's just, he's just magnetic in that you want to be around him. You want to be like him. You want, you want to learn from him. And so as a young captain, uh, well, maybe not so young because I got 12 years in the service <laughs> at this time, but I, I really look, you know, everybody kind of looked up to him and said, you know, he's the guy you want to learn from. And so our relationship, our kind of our combat pairing really started there. Um, even though we, you know, we really didn't get combat paired officially until the start of, uh, OIF, but, uh, you know, we were working together, uh, deployed to Nellis and then we come back, we go to Afghanistan. And like I said, I kind of meet up late with him there. And then we, you know, he's running ops. I'm the number two guy for him in Afghanistan. And, and then we redeploy. Uh, together, although uh, I sh- it took me three extra weeks because I had I had to bring broke airplanes back, but uh, but we redeployed together, and then as soon as I get back, uh, we're deploying again for kind of OIF spin up, and then boom, we deploy to OIF, and then that's when I, I believe it was Bino and you combat paired everybody for night one of OIF, and that's when we officially got combat paired, and when we so it. I want to say that, you know, our first OIF mission was 19 March of 2003, night one. Uh, but really, that coordination, that that uh, that combat pairing, that relationship started when we first met in 2000. And so it had been it had been growing and developing for three years. And just like you said, Mark, I could have easily gotten a PCS between then and now. But uh but we were getting ready to go to war. We'd already gone to Afghanistan and we're getting ready to go to OIF. And I think the squadron actually got a waiver so they didn't have to PCS uh, many people. And so I was one of the lucky ones that got to stick around. And uh, yeah. And so it was fortunate that our, that our time together kind of developed over, you know, that three years. All right. Well, let's get to uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, let's kind of back up a little bit, and and Doc, let's start with you. Just, you know, we're starting to hear this in the news cycle, right? For everybody out there who's a civilian at the time. I mean, obviously, we had a little bit different, uh, you know, pieces of information in the military. We knew we knew kind of more ahead of the train up. But when do you start hearing about Iraq, and what does the train up look like? And do you have any idea what your missions are at this going at this point in time? Uh, do you know you're going to be part of the invasion? Kind of give us all the background of, of that. Yeah, you, you bet, Mark. So uh, uh, I, I would say, quite honestly, it didn't take too long. I think we got back from uh, I think we got back from uh, Afghanistan in October of 2002, and it didn't take but about four to six weeks or so before we started hearing rumblings that uh, there was high potential uh, that there was going to be some activity in Iraq and uh, that there would be a little bit of a swing, you know, from Afghanistan to Iraq and that the 75th Fighter Squadron Tiger Sharks were going to feature pretty prominently in, uh, you know, the, the opening phase of hostilities in Iraq. Uh, and, you know, needless to say, from the standpoint of the guys, um, uh, we were obviously pretty excited about that. Um, uh, our, our spouses and uh, our families were not, were not quite as excited. They didn't as have we the were. same level of excitement about the whole thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, there was, there was a little bit of consternation there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it, it started pretty early. And then... Um, One of the things um, that we did in the 75th Fighter Squadron was we participated in uh, a spin-up of what was called, um, I I don't want to get too too deep into it, but uh, we got involved in, you know, some, um, 
special operations related activity, which was unusual uh, for us, at least in the scope and scale that we were going to be required to participate. And uh, and so that that was one of the things that we were, you know, spinning up for uh, in the November, December, January time frame. Uh, and then I think it was mid-February um, or maybe it was mid-January. We actually knew that there were going to be deployment orders that were coming down. So at that point in time, we were getting ready to go with the intent that we were going to deploy in uh, late January, early February. And uh, we were going to go right back to uh, Al Jabber Airfield, which is in Kuwait. And that was, a, that was an airfield that uh, most of us were very, very familiar with. Uh, because we had done multiple rotations uh, out of Al Jabber uh, in the um, post uh, Desert Storm, you know, then Southern Watch environment. So, Al Jabber Air Base in Kuwait was something that was very familiar uh, to to the A10 community, uh, and that's where we actually started. Um, OIF was from Kuwait, uh, and then. Eventually, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but eventually, uh, as you know, the United States Army and the United States Marines started to take ground in uh, southern Iraq and move to the north northwest. Uh, they pushed through, um, you know, central Iraq. They uh, took uh, Talil Air Base, uh, which was an Iraqi air base in central Iraq, and. Uh, that was when a decision was made as we started to posture for the Battle of Baghdad uh, to forward deploy United States Air Force fixed wing fighters uh, into Talil. And uh, the 75th, in concert with several of our sister reserve units, uh, we ended up building kind of a composite unit um, of multiple units. Uh, and we forward deployed into Talil, and that's where we were as we started to posture to fight for the battle for Baghdad in support of 269 armor. Do you get a sense um, of the level of combat that you're going to be in? And again, you know, uh, Billy Bobby mentioned earlier that you had seen some things, you know, in, in Desert Storm and both in, in, uh, in Somalia, but do you, do you realize at this point the level of combat that either one of you are headed towards, and it's unlike anything you have experienced at this point in your career. I did. I felt like, well, I hadn't been in in an airplane during uh, Desert Storm, but uh, I felt like we were going to be doing Desert Storm too. I, I just felt like, okay, this is full on. Everyone's deploying, and especially because, like Donk said, you know, we we were gearing up. And, you know, one of your, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Lieutenant uh, Bloker, Coke, here in a minute. But uh, I think it was December time frame. Uh, I had to tell him or or Donk and I had to tell him that he wasn't going to get to deploy with us and fly the A-10. He's getting pulled up uh, to support 269 Armor. And he wasn't the only lieutenant in our squadron that got that. I think four or five, maybe more guys ended up, you know, packing their, their army gear and having to deploy with the army. So we, we, we knew not only are we going, but there's a whole bunch of, uh, army battalions going and it, it's going to be full on. This isn't, this isn't messing around. So I, I, I without a doubt knew that this wasn't going to be Afghanistan. This was going to be something different. Yeah. And, and Mark, if I can piggyback on to what yeah, Billy sure. Bob is describing there. Um, you know, I, I, it, clearly we expected uh, that we were going to face an enemy that was um, well equipped and comparatively well trained, you know, um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, large, large armies in in the Middle East, if you will. And uh, the other thing I think that made it unique and kind of was very sobering for us was uh you know, the air defense uh, capability that the Iraqis had on paper, you know, and I mean, we can debate all day long about, you know, quantity versus quality versus, you know, training and how, uh, you know, the Iraqi air defense um, network, you know, kind of 
stood up against a, a, an onslaught of combined arms effects. Um, but we, we definitely anticipated, especially in the very early part of the campaign, uh, you know, night one, as Billy Bob describes before, we anticipated uh, that if we were actually asked to do some of the things that we were training to do, we were going to have very significant casualty rates. Uh, and, and there would have to be, you know, immediate reinforcement from the United States with other squadrons because uh, we would begin losing jets and we would begin losing pilots. So it, it was very sobering. And to Billy Bob's point, uh, radically different than the air defense environment that we experienced in Afghanistan. So Scope and scale, he's got it right. It was going to be Desert Storm too. Over. <laughs> got it. And Mark, and Go Mark, ahead. our uh, our squadron commander, Bino Turner. I think I think he had Desert Storm experience and had flown in Desert Storm as an A ten pilot. And I do remember, like, uh, we finally got everyone in theater. Uh, I don't. I want to say it was first of March or something around that time frame, but it's, it's about two weeks before night one. And I, I vaguely, or I, I distinctly remember uh, him bringing the entire squadron together and looking everyone in the eye and going, we will lose people. This is serious. Don't mess around, you know, and, you know, everyone had the utmost respect for him. He's, he's a combat veteran and uh, eyeballs got big. People got serious and, uh, but that team, the one thing we haven't really talked about is how great of a team we had. And, uh, a lot of it was the fact of Bino and Donk's leadership and, and other guys, but, uh, you know, leading up to this, we had deployed several times uh, throughout the United States. And then we had done the, the Kuwait and the Afghanistan thing. And now it's, you know, the early 2003 and we're, we're taking this team, our maintainers, our life support, our Intel, um, our admin troops, um, you know, and I'm probably forgetting a few, but all these people that had deployed, uh, several times with us and it, everybody knew it, you know, like, like you were asking, did they know that it was serious? Yeah, they knew. And then you got the combat veteran squadron commander looking you in the eye and going, we may not all make it home. So yeah, it, it was intense. Uh, some eyeballs got big, and but n no one batted an eye. No one got scared. They all knew their mission. They all performed superbly. And it was just, it was a well-oiled machine at that time. I I've never been associated with a team that that executed every part of their mission so precisely, so accurately than we did during 2003 in the 75th Fighter Squad. It's crazy because, you know, when, when you hear we're going to lose people like I never said that to anybody that I was in charge of. I, I mean, I, I stress the seriousness of it and the gravity of the situation, but I never heard you know, we're going to lose some people. Uh, and, and I just wonder, when when you guys hear that as A-10 pilots, is there a certain amount of, you know, like bubble that you're in because, hey, I'm 10, 12,000 feet up and I have more control up here than they do on the ground? Like, when you guys hear that specifically as pilots, is there any sense of it's not likely going to be me? Because as you talked about, I mean, their air defense was there, but clearly we had the upper hand from a technology standpoint. So you had to feel pretty secure am i overestimating things no i think you're absolutely correct i when i say that i don't think he was specifically saying he's gonna we're gonna lose an a-10 pilot right. he just knew that the seriousness of the war i mean they were throwing scuds at us uh and so he was trying to emphasize the importance of you know being in the correct mop gear and and not not taking anything for granted especially the first couple of weeks because we thought we were going to get slimed without a doubt and get kimmed you know uh, it, it was <laughs> it was like it's happening you know he saddam's for real this time and because he knows we're coming to get him and he knows we're not going to stop at the outskirts of baghdad this time like they did in desert storm one he knew that we're taking we're taking over the land and we're going to go find him so uh, I think the emphasis on we're going to lose people was more in kind of the total uh, 
the total picture of the war, not specifically, hey, we're going to lose an A-10 pilot, but it put the seriousness of what we are about to accomplish, and especially coming from, you know, a Desert Storm veteran uh, and someone that we looked up to, especially our leadership, saying, you know, that, that, that I think was his way of saying, take do everything to your utmost perfection. Don't skip anything and watch each other's back. So that that's kind of my opinion on that. Yeah. And Go ahead, Doc. I would say too, Mark, it was, uh, it was the only time in my career that I ever felt uh, compelled uh, to write a letter to Teresa and to my children uh, in the event of my demise. Wow. And, uh, you know, those were, um, those were letters that were safeguarded, uh, you know, in a, in a safe in the squadron commander's office and Bino's office, as I recall. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was very, very sobering. Um, and, uh, and I certainly agree with, you know, Billy Bob's perspective that, uh, it, it was it was more writ large about you know the United States and the coalition and you know we're we're not going to bring everybody back home and uh, yeah I'll leave it at that yeah and, and again I I still chuckle when I hear the idea of gas being used against us um, but your 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 gas mask was the worst paperweight you had in Iraq uh, beyond two thousand three we knew that was never coming so uh, both my times of my deployment, uh, I was issued a gas mask and it sat in the same spot when I first landed in Baghdad and it never moved until I picked it up to go home. So, uh, so, so oh, man, fun. I used to, I used to take my best naps with my gas mask yeah. on. <laughs> Became a de facto pillow. About <laughs> it. So, uh, anyway, uh, good times back in the day. All right. So the invasion starts itself on March 20th. Now the event we're talking about for you guys isn't until April 6th. Now, again, for those who don't remember, the invasion started on March 20th, but it, it happened in 24 hours that we overtook the entire city. Uh, yes, we moved fairly quickly to the outskirts of Baghdad, but there was um, obviously it, it took a little time to actually control the whole entire thing. And, you know, the statue falls and all that. So uh, let's go back to a couple of days prior to April 6th, when this specific mission kicks off. Now, uh, just for reference point for those watching, you guys, your, your main point was uh, Objective Montgomery, right? And, and that's, uh, or Objective Monty, as you guys called it. That's what was, was in your area of operations that you were looking at. And again, for civilians listening, when you lay out the battlefield, you'll lay certain areas as objectives. Objective Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, everybody gets you. I don't know who comes up with the names, but they do. Uh, somebody does in, in, in the plan shop in the G3 or J3, whatever it is, A3. And uh, you guys had Objective Monty or Objective Montgomery, but let's go back and start a kind of couple of days prior and, and what you're seeing and what you're hearing, any other sorties you might have flown and things of that nature sort of set the scene for what happens going forward. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll take a stab at it, Mark, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Billy Bob. So, so um, you know, in terms of, you know, Objective Monty, uh, and then I'll address that first, and then we'll kind of talk a couple of days prior to that. Uh, so we did not know uh, on the 6th of April that we were going to go to Objective Monty. Uh, I'll just set that up real quick because it's a good time to do that. But, you know, we're, we're flying out of Toledo. Billy Bob and I are combat pairs. Both of us are flight leads. The way that he and I orchestrate it between the two of us is... I'll lead one sortie, then he'll lead one sortie, and we just kind of go back and forth that way, right. uh, each of us being a flight lead and each of us being a wingman. On um, on that particular day, on the 6th, uh, Billy Bob was the flight lead for our first sortie of the day. That was in support of the U.S. Marines that were doing uh, clearance operations in Anazaria. Uh it was primarily uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance support that we were providing to them. We didn't go kinetic on that particular sortie. We come back to the real, we land, we gas up, take off on the second sortie. This time we're bound for the Northwest and we're bound for Baghdad, that general area. We talked to the Air Support Operations Center, which is responsible for fielding all of the US Army and the Marine Corps' request for fire support. Uh, and what they do is uh, we, we hit an air-to-air refueling uh, tanker, 
we uh, top off our gas tanks and we go into what's called a closed air support stack, a cast stack. Uh, and all we're doing is, is we're just another flight of two airplanes, could be Marines, could be Air Force, could be Navy, and we're stacked up anywhere from 20,000 to 30,000 feet at 1,000 foot block intervals. Uh, and we're just waiting. We're waiting for a tasking. Uh, and so on this particular sortie, uh, we did not have a deliberate target. We did not have a deliberate area on the ground where we had been able to study, you know, terrain features, friendly order of battle, enemy order of battle, threat arrays. We didn't have that. And so we were on call close air support. Uh, and so that's kind of where we were on the 6th of April, just to kind of set the stage. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to that later. And let me ask you uh, quick, the, you, you mentioned yeah, Nasiria. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned Nasiria. I just want to set some of this. Nasiria is all the way in the south. Um, and right. for those who don't know Baghdad, and not many of you would unless you've been there, you know, there's one main road that kind of cuts through all of, of Iraq. It separates the left and the right or the, the east and the west for via like I-95 for those on the east coast, I-5 for those on the west coast. I-35 for those in Dallas and going north. Um, right. And and just it kind of, you know, bisects the whole country. Nasiriya is is in the south. Were you guys just sort of slowly working your way up, you know, that main road, Route 1 is where, where it is in Baghdad, just one mission at a time, just overwatching the people on the ground as they started to climb north? So for all practical purposes, that's a great way to look at it. We okay. were we were leapfrogging with the ground units to right. the northwest toward Baghdad. Got it. OK. And, and so, you know, so that's actually that's a great setup for kind of the nature of the sorties that we were doing uh, in the days leading up to the 6th of April, uh, because it could range from. No kidding, a close air support operation in support of engaged troopers on the ground, uh, you know, that required close integration and required us to, you know, expend ordnance in close proximity to friendly forces to destroy the enemy. Or alternatively, you know, we could be out in front of advancing ground forces in what Clearly. we described as a as a as a kill container as, right. and doing you know, visual recce, doing um, forward strike control and reconnaissance, and actually not necessarily having any ground units in vicinity of where we were operating, but trying to degrade the enemy's capability, you know, to defend or to go offensive as our guys would push the contact. Got it. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Billy Bob? Sure. Uh, I think... Mark's trying to get at it's like what got us to Talil, and that was a very important piece in the time frame of this. Is we're still operating out of Jabber on April third, and Donk grabs me uh, late in the afternoon, and he's like, "Hey, go back to your bunk and pack your crap." And I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, you and me, and I think it was Gecko." Uh, 10 guys and we're gonna jump up we're taking a c-130 ride up to a nazari and i'm like wait a minute didn't didn't we just do the jessica lynch operation there 48 hours ago like one april and and now we're gonna go live there and he's like yep and so we get in a c-130 on the night of uh april 3rd and this thing lands blacked out. They won't even they won't even turn on the interior lights of the C-130. They don't shut the engines off. They just drop the back ramp. And they tell us in about, I think we had 15 or so maintainers with us and a couple of Intel and they're like, get out. And they're like, okay. And so we get out and we're, they shut the door and they start taxiing and take off. And there's no welcoming party. There's no base ops. We're just standing on a piece of concrete in Iraq and trying to find out where are we supposed to go. And I actually pull out my MVGs because I had all my flight gear with me. So I pulled out the MVGs that I fly with and I'm starting to look around and I get, we finally see somebody on a, on a truck driving towards us with their lights out. And, and so that was three April, uh, we get set up, uh, we go to bed the next morning, we wake up 
And then on 4 April is the first day that A-10s landed in Talil, which is just south of Al-Nazaria. Right. And so they bring the airplanes in. Uh, we got gas, uh, and I think we had bullets, but we didn't have anything else as far as ammunition. Uh, so if the airplane landed with bombs, then you had bombs. If the airplane landed empty, they'd fill it up with bullets, and that's what you got. So Donk and I flew our first mission out of Talil on 4 April, and we got assigned up in Baghdad, and that's when Thunder Run 1 was going on. So I think they the 82nd paratrooped into Baghdad International the night of 3 April as well. And then uh, they took the airfield, but they bring the first armor column up on Thunder Run 1 on 4 April. And we actually got to support that uh, as they're making the bend on Highway 8 into Baghdad International. So we started supporting them when they were about 20 miles, maybe 15 miles from Baghdad International. Uh, they asked us to go forward, and they they said that a Predator or a UAV had spotted some uh, anti-aircraft uh, artillery, and they thought that they had the guns pointed down so that they would, you know, kind of ambush the convoy as they were coming through. And sure enough, as soon as we flew over them, we were getting lit up by 57 millimeter anti-aircraft artillery. So we engaged those, and then... Uh, we finally, as they made the turn and were entering Baghdad International, we went back. So we got to support Thunder Run 1 on 4 April. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't remember exactly what missions or if we supported anything on 5 April, but then uh, obviously Donk told you kind of our two missions on the April the 6th. All right. And, and just a little more lead up in those previous missions that you had run, are you getting a sense that? this is different than what you thought. Are you getting a sense that there is a um, certain level of, 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 I, I guess, you know, the, the enemy's fortitude that you didn't expect? Like, I mean, I, you know, how, how much contact were you guys actually engaging in prior to April 6th, comparatively speaking? Um, I, I'll take a stab at that one, Mark, and, and Billy Bob can correct me as required. So I would say that, you know, from kind of like an individual fighting spirit uh, of the enemy and, you know, capability of the enemy, um, it, it varied, um, you know, uh, anywhere from, you know, <laughs> dudes that would want to surrender with white flags the guys that were flying over the top of them at 10,000 feet you know all the way to a very determined resolute and capable enemy who who was going to do their be their very best to try to kill you as you tried to kill them and uh and you know, I, I think maybe some of it has to do with you know whether or not it was kind of a, a, a normal you know kind of straight leg kind of uh, conscript infantry battalion or brigade you know versus maybe being you know part of the Special Republican Guard, uh, and you know we didn't know you know all the time who we were going to face. Uh, and so I, I would say that it would have been very easy to have been lulled into a sense of complacency, which I think, you know, to kind of tie back to what Billy Bob was describing earlier with regard to, you know, Bino's advice to us is, you know, don't let that happen. Don't get sucked in. You know, you, you never know. Uh, and, you know, with, um, uh, with, you know, anti-aircraft artillery, you know, of all different calibers, you know, anywhere from 23 millimeter up to 100 millimeter. Uh, and then two, you know, the capability for mobile surface to air missiles um, and, and fixed site surface uh, or air to surface missiles, um, you know, that, that can change in a heartbeat um, uh, when you start having missiles fly in the air. Uh, and, and so that's kind of my characterization of what we experienced. Sometimes it was very, very resolute and determined. Other times, um, it wasn't. Billy Bob? 
Yeah, exactly true. Um, and I think the day of six April actually kind of kind of showcases what the combat was like and that you'd have one sortie where you're out there supporting guys and no kinetic fires and you know you spend two and a half hours of loiter time just being there for cover if in case you know they need they need to make the call for you to come help them out to you know the sortie on 6 april where it's fangs out getting shot at every pass uh you know it i think the i think the intensity uh for me started on 4 april when i flew the first sortie out of talil and we're over baghdad because before that you would see very little triple a but but again leading up to 4 april out of flying out of jabber we sat csar csar alert all the time and there was a couple of, of launches and a couple of csar missions that our squadron was flying so we knew the seriousness of it guys are getting shot down um but for me personally, um, I didn't see a really heavy AAA until 4 April when we were over the city supporting in the uh, inside of Baghdad. Curious to know, one more question. I keep putting this off April 6th, but I, I, I just, I like to ask this of pilots because I, I think it's a different experience. You know, I, we talk a lot on the podcast about, you know, once you pull the trigger, Right. And on the other end of that isn't a paper target. It's not a, a pop up target on a range. Um, once you pull that trigger, you're never the same again. Right. Like you're just a different person. Um, and, and whether that's a religious experience for some people or a moral one or whatever, uh, however you choose to characterize it. I know that I'm different. I, I, it just it changes you. But when you're at teens, thousands of feet away and their little spots to me, it's almost like, well, it's almost video game-ish. Like, there's a certain personal level to combat that you take offense to when a bullet whizzes by your head that you can get emotionally charged up about. But I don't know if that's the same for you guys sitting up at your level and what it's like, you know, raining down a lot of mass destruction on those below you. So can you guys each speak to that experience personally for you? Yeah. Uh, you bet, Mark. So uh, this actually kind of ties into something that um, I didn't I didn't make mention of earlier, but but would have answered one of your questions. And that is, is that uh, at least for me, um, I never felt vulnerable in the cockpit. Uh, I was inside a titanium bathtub. I knew that the mighty warthog was built uh, to sustain heavy battle damage and to uh, you know, get the pilot back over friendly lines. You know, you may not have always been able to land a severely disabled jet, you know, like Kim Campbell did, you know, uh, and, and I think you, you already alluded to it, but, you know, Kim was operating in exactly the same area on the 7th of April that Billy Bob and I were operating in on the 6th of April when she got hit uh, by AAA. Uh, and, and actually, I say AAA. I still don't know whether or not we actually know if it was AAA or it was a missile. Um, but we were operating in exactly the same place. So I'll get to your question here in a second. But I, I would contend that there is a sense of uh, invincibility. And part of that, too, is, is and I don't know what the experience is on the ground, but I imagine that there's a part of you that kind of compartmentalizes, you know, your mortality uh, and, you know, yeah. compels you to do things that maybe otherwise you wouldn't do, right. uh, you know, when you're in mortal danger. And then I would say that um, even as an A-10 pilot and maybe more specifically as an A-10 pilot, I kind of had both experiences and, and I'll characterize it this way. Um, I did some fighting in the Korangal Valley uh, in Afghanistan, uh, back in the 2002 time frame. Uh, and then again, actually in 2005, uh, uh, 2006. Um, but I actually got the opportunity to see the people that I was trying to destroy on the ground mm -hmm. as they tried to escape 
uh, from a from an ambush that they had laid for our guys that were patrolling. Uh, so I I could actually see the people very vividly uh, that I was trying to kill. And then I also had the experience where you know you're strafing, you know, in a sixty degree uh, strafe pass, or you're dropping bombs, or you're shooting Maverick missiles. Uh, and you're doing that from 20,000 feet or 15,000 feet. And to your point, you don't necessarily see the individuals themselves, but you definitely see vehicles uh, that get destroyed, uh, AAA pieces that get destroyed. So um, I've had both of those experiences, and I couldn't agree with you more that it, it changes you. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Billy Bob? Well, in when we were in Afghanistan, I didn't get a chance to employ. So really my first employment uh, in combat was night one, which for us, Mark, was 19 March, not 20 March. Uh, we were We launched 10 airplanes that night as part of a larger task force to, I'll just say, prep the battlefield. Um, and we flew out of Jabber. We hit the tanker. Uh, we did some work. We hit the tanker again, uh, did some more work, hit the tanker again, and flew home. So it was a long, I think it was six hours or something of a mission. But it was, it was about an hour and a half transit time, maybe more, maybe close to two hours each way, something like that. It was... But anyhow, on my first pass, which was a, a bomb pass, um, I dropped the bombs and the uh, the person that was uh, designating the target for us said, after uh, my bombs had hit, he said, good hits. Those three people aren't alive anymore. And that was the first indication that uh, I had ever uh, um, shot someone in, in combat. So... Uh, that was tough. And it, it, it was, uh, and, and I think it might've been the same for Donk. It might've been his first time. Um, but I do remember, uh, that flight home after we hit the tanker, it was me and Donk. Um, and we didn't say much, uh, for about two hours, uh, where normally we, we would chit chat. We would, we would talk about things. We would, we would, you know, say what we needed to say, either in the course of, of normal flight uh, communication or just to talk to make sure that we're still awake. And, and but this time we didn't we just kind of reflected on what that night was. And uh, it changed me. I, I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, being the first time that I knew, you know, that someone says that, hey, you those three people are no longer with us. And so. Um, yeah, it changes you. Yeah, just to, you know, and, perspective, and, I think. Yeah, and Mark, you know, he, you know, so here's what Billy Bob's not telling you about night one. So I was his flight lead on night one, or at least I was an element lead um, a, as part of uh, that. Uh, what do we have, Billy Bob? We have an eight ship. Yeah, I think we had we I had ten. Ten. So why? Uh, the weather yeah. was absolutely terrible that night. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was, but there was a pretty good um, sandstorm brewing. And I actually rolled in on the target that Billy Bob subsequently destroyed uh, with the intent that I was going to drop my bombs. No. But as I rolled in, I got uh, spatially disoriented and I, I completely lost kind of my situational awareness about where I was geospatially in proximity to the ground. Uh, and I knew um, that I was not going to be able to execute a successful bomb pass. Uh, I, it took everything that I had to focus on the artificial horizon uh, to kind of regain my sense of geospatial awareness and then to be able to recover my airplane before I hit the ground. I was going to say, and, that's uh, bad. Yeah, yeah. I, would I don't know much about piloting, bad. but when you talk about geospatial awareness in relation to the ground, I kind of got nervous there for a minute. <laughs> well, 
Well, let me tell you what, brother, there was pretty significant pucker factor in my cockpit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I managed, uh, I managed not to hit the ground, but Good job. Billy Bob was textbook. He knew that I had not expanded my ordinance. He knew that it was a priority target. Uh, I was clear and he rolled in, he destroyed the target. So there's a little bit more to that story because um, that's not necessarily what he expected to have to do. And yet he was flawless in execution. I I'm wondering, Billy Bob, are you watching him out of the corner of your eye going, what the hell is going on with him? Where's he going? Oh, it was so dark that night. And we were using uh, offsetting deconfliction tactics that we weren't really visual at, ah, at, the, gotcha. at all. So we, we don't have our lights on. Uh, you know, with the NVGs, I can kind of see the green dot and that's about it. I can't tell, you know, that he's spatially disoriented. I just, I would know if he got really low and could say something to him, but that's about the mutual support I, I was able to provide at the night. Well, considering he's your boss, you wouldn't want to refer to him as spatially disoriented all the time. So <laughs> it's probably in your best interest to let that one go. Well, <laughs> you know, people know him, so... <laughs> <laughs> all right uh we put it off long enough right april 6th uh let's let's get through kind of the the initial part of uh the opening of the battle uh and again to, for those listening you know the, you both were awarded silver stars for your for your efforts and and the things that you did so kind of uh let's start at the beginning of what you heard going into the battle uh what was expected how did it unfold and when you finally get the call to, to you know to get in the air and start doing what you have to do Okay, uh, I'll take a stab at that, um, Mark. So I think uh, I think I've already set the stage for the team in terms of you know the Air Support Operations Center. Uh, and sorry about that. I had to plug some power in. Um, That's spatial disorientation right there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so. So we, we kind of we kind of talked about what was going on with the Air Support Operations Center and the fact that we were just holding in a cast stack, you know, with the power pulled back, trying to conserve gas uh, in anticipation that there would be some tasking for us. And so, uh, you know, the Air Support Operations Center came up over the radio. Uh, our call sign on that particular day uh, was DMOB 7-1 a horrific call sign that I don't know why it, it came up as our number that particular day, but it did. So we were DMOB 71, flight of two A-10s. And the Air Sport Operations Center told us that we were to contact Advance 33, uh, who was a uh, ground air liaison officer tied to Task Force 269 Armor. And they needed us to do some reconnaissance in the vicinity in the vicinity of Objective Monty, uh, and so at that time it kind of seemed very benign, uh, and and maybe maybe even a repeat of the sortie that Billy Bob and I had experienced over on Nazaria, you know, earlier that morning, and. Uh, the one thing that we knew that was probably going to make it more challenging, there were really kind of two things, is one was the weather. Uh, there were pretty significant uh, sandstorms um, that were pretty thick. Um, I also remember um, there being uh, some thunderstorms that were kind of intermixed in the sandstorms. So that we, we knew that in order to do our tasking, we were going to have to get below that weather, get below the sandstorm, uh, which was going to require us to fly lower than what the rules of engagement at the time permitted us to do. So that was kind of one thing that was in the back of my mind as, as the flight lead for that particular sortie is, is we're going to have to get below this weather. We're going to we're going to have to, you know, make an assessment about whether or not the nature of the tasking that Advance 33 would ask us to do would actually justify us um, violating the rules of engagement, if you will, and flying below 10,000 feet. 
All right, so give, just give the, the audience, time. Give, I'm sorry, give the audience the, the, the understanding of the rules of engagement of why you can't fly below 10,000. Is that for your own safety or is that for yeah. something going on on the ground? No, that was that was for our own safety. They wanted to try, you know, the, the theory is, is that when you're operating three dimensionally uh, with above 10,000 feet, you're that much more difficult for AAA uh, or SAMs to engage. Um, and so, so that was, that was kind of one of the things that was, that was weighing on my mind. Uh, and then, you know, really the second thing was, is now, I mean, notwithstanding the sortie that we flew in support of, you know, Thunder Run One, um, now we're going to be flying potentially low altitude over Baghdad. And Baghdad is a completely different environment than maybe what we had experienced with the fielded forces as we moved from Kuwait to the northwest toward Baghdad. Uh, much, much more uh, dense uh threat environment over Baghdad so those those were kind of the two things that were uh on my mind initially as we rolled over on the frequency and we started to communicate with advanced three three and you know there's a there's an interesting there's an interesting kind of dance that you go through as you roll to a new frequency and you're talking to somebody that's on the ground and and you know there's always a discussion of call signs and who you are. And there's a standard litany of what your check-in is, which is, you know, how much gas do I have? How much playtime do I have? What kind of ordinance do I have? You're trying to build a picture for the person that you're communicating with on the ground for what capability you can bring to them and how long they might be able to employ you. You also go through an authentication uh, using a, 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 a pre-made um, matrix, if you will, where me as DMOB 7-1 would check in with Advance 3-3. And before I started describing anything to them, I would ask him to authenticate. And it would all be via alphanumeric. So I would say Advance 3-3, this is DMOB 7-1, two Alpha 10s checking in, request you authenticate Alpha Bravo. And then based on the matrix that he has, he would look at Alpha and Bravo in terms of columns and rows. And then he would pick whatever that intersecting letter is. Say for this example, it's X-ray. So I was expecting Advanced 3.3 to come back to me and say, DMOP 7.1, this is Advanced 3.3, I authenticate X-ray. And now we know we're talking to friendlies and we know that we're not being spoofed, if you will, by the enemy. So um, that's not exactly the way that our check-in went. So I said, uh, advanced 3-3, this is DMOB 7-1, you know, flight of two Alpha 10s, request you authenticate Alpha Bravo. And what I got back was, is, Donk, this is Coke. And so right away, <laughs> number one, we had, we had a very clear authentication of who we were talking to on the ground. Uh, and then number two, and this is something that Billy Bob alluded to a little bit earlier, you know, it, 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 it takes on a little bit of a different feeling. And, and I want to be careful about how I characterize this because we've already talked before about, I don't care who it is. I, I don't care if it's an army trooper. I don't care if it's a Marine. I don't care if it's a coalition guy we are there to support our brothers and sisters on the ground in this case it's brothers but that's what we do and that's what we dedicated our professional lives to as a 10 pilots and i mean that's that's our bread and butter that's who we are and so to take it just a little notch up now i can picture coke and I can picture him in the squadron, back in Pope, me and Billy Bob, talking to him about having to pack his bags and go to war on the ground, leave behind his bride, Jamie, who was pregnant with their first son, and know that now this is the guy that I'm supporting on the ground, and he's the guy that's supporting the task force. 
it kind of it kind of uh, camps it up a little bit, if you will. Um, Billy Bob, you got anything you want to add to that? Nope, you hit the nail on the head. Okay. All right, Mark, back to you, brother. <laughs> okay, so you find out that it's your buddy Coke on the other end. Um, and, I mean, I guess that's got to be a reassuring feeling that it's somebody you actually know as opposed to a different JTAC or whatever it may be. Um, but it, it, does Coke start to clue you in on, on what is lying ahead of you? You know, so uh... – uh, the, the way that I remember it, um, and, you know, Billy Bob will maybe be able to add some clarity to this because of the different roles and responsibilities that we have to perform uh, when we're operating as a flight lead and when we're operating as a wingman. But the way that I recall it is uh, he described for us um, that they were, you know, moving toward Objective Monty. Objective Monty was a bridge that crossed the Tigris River. Mm -hmm. uh, the mission of the task force was to seize that bridge. Uh, at the time, we didn't know exactly why, but we found out subsequently it was, you know, to complete uh, in concert with the Marines an encirclement. Uh, of Baghdad to the north uh, so that we would bottle up the Special Republican Guard in Baghdad and be able to take them out in Baghdad as opposed to letting them egress out of, out of the kill zone, if you will, to the northwest in Iraq and regroup. Um, so we didn't know that at the time. We just knew that he wanted us to perform reconnaissance in vicinity of uh objective monty right billy bob what do you what do you want to add to that i'll i'll just you know people would probably want to know where we're at and we're we're 100 150 miles south of baghdad when we first check in and we're on top of the sandstorm the the, the haboob had just come through like a few hours prior and we're talking sand visibility in thunderstorms up to, I want to say 16, 17,000. And so we're sitting up probably 20 is what I'd want to guess, uh, 20,000 feet. And it's just nothing but brown sand below us as we're talking to Coke. And like Donk said, it was, Hey, Donk, is that you? This is Coke. Uh, and yeah, it took on it took on a very personal feeling at that point. But just like just like Donk said, there was no sense of urgency. There was a hey, here's the AO update. Uh, you know, we're trying to seize this bridge. Um, you know, the standard, very calm. You know, as we're driving in there, uh, discussion of how 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 the battlefield looks. Nothing like hey, we're what about what what we're about to get and that's the radio call of hold on a second coke comes back and he goes hey we're taking direct enemy tank fire we need you in here now and so it it was i, I don't want to say benign but it was just your standard information back and forth kind of building our situational awareness as we're tr you know traveling towards baghdad getting closer and let me above the sandstorm let me give some of the civilians listening some sort of simplifying tactical advice. Uh, you talk about the bridge that we wanted to secure. Go back to the end of Saving Private Ryan, right? I mean, you can literally segment the battlefield if there is a river that you have That's to cross, right. which is very difficult. And so it was a way to block and sort of form a, you know, uh, visual circle around uh, Baghdad to to overtake it. And you talked about escaping to the north and the west. Well, for those who don't know, when you get to the west of Baghdad, you know, there's Fallujah and Ramadi, but when you talk Karbala and everything else, once you get west of the Euphrates, it's nothing but vast desert. And so it's easy for them, since they live in vast desert, to know where to go and how to get out of there and refit and regroup and rearm and get back in the fight. And so that's what we were trying to avoid. And, and when you can secure a bridge like that, and again, this is for the civilians listening, you can contend to control a lot more area of land than you physically have to stand on, uh, per se. But as you mentioned, the idea is to encase Baghdad with these different objective points. Um, and once you control them all, 
then you have the city at a choke point in a bottleneck when you can literally just squeeze the life out of it like an anaconda and they then you take the ground that that you want to take and so that was just kind of some of the uh, i guess tactical background a very raw uh, sort of unabridged tactical background of of uh, of how you go about taking a city and why that that bridge was so important but let's get back to the call that you heard that we're taking direct enemy fire um and, and i'm curious because you you look down and you see this blanket of brown and you see no buildings you see no terrain reference you see no you know anything you can look down and, and sort of orient yourself um to where this is all happening so how do you know where to go how are you directed explain that whole process yeah, sure, Mark. Uh, so uh, that's kind of interesting, Billy Bob. And uh, so we had GPS in our jets at the time, which is actually um, something, it's a detail that's actually a very important detail, but I, it wasn't as fresh in, it, it's not as fresh in my mind as I recollect what happened on the sortie uh, versus what it is in Billy Bob's, but there's a reason for that and I'll explain it. So, you know, for, uh, for A-10 pilots, we pride ourselves on the fact that, you know, we still carry binoculars. We still look out the canopy. Uh, we still operate off of the maps. Uh, the things that we do are not all digital displays. Now we have the capability to do that in an airplane that is, you know, a Charlie model versus an alpha model airplane. Um, but at this point in time, um, our experience with the GPS was comparatively new. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's one thing I kind of want to preface our, def our, our descent into the weather with, and that is we, you know, Billy Bob kind of alluded to it earlier when he described the placard that we had walking out of the squadron that said the mission is an 18 year old with a rifle. And, and we kind of had a corollary to that. And that was, you know, find ways to say yes, because an 18 year old warrior's life may depend on what you do today. And one of the things that, uh, you know, as both the director of operations and then subsequently as the squadron commander, uh, because I did uh, have a combat change of command uh, at Talil during OIF. Um, one of the things that, you know, we, we, we would tell our, our, our entire team was, if you can come back and you can explain to me why it is you did what you did and how what you did contributed to finding ways to say yes in order to accomplish your mission of protecting the 18 year old, then I didn't necessarily care exactly what you had to do to do that in terms of violating rules of engagement to get the mission done. And, and I don't, I don't say that, you know, frivolously, I don't say that with bravado, I say that very seriously. That was, you know, our commander's guidance and intent to our team. I'm not going to dictate to you how it is that you're going to do things, but if you can explain to me how you met that commander's guidance and intent, uh, I will stand behind you and I will stand in front of you all day long when people question what you do. Um, now, if Alternatively, if you violate that, you know, I'll be the first one to come after you uh, and, you know, discipline you. Uh, so if you take that in the context of what Billy Bob and I were getting ready to face as we descended through that storm, knowing that we were going to have to violate the minimum altitude and we were probably going to violate some other rules of engagement, uh, depending upon how this engagement progressed. Uh, we didn't have to do a whole lot of thinking, uh, about we've got task force 269 armor. We've got cope. They've told us they're taking direct enemy tank rounds. We know at this point in time that they're black for fuel and weapons. They're in hasty defensive positions on the Western side of the bridge, which is objective Monty. And we got to get down there. We got to help. 
And so I don't know that there was a whole lot of conversation between Billy Bob and I about what we were getting ready to do. Uh, but I, based on the fact that we were combat pairs, Billy Bob knew instinctively that we were going into the weather and we were going to find a way that we were going to help these guys. And so he had closed up his formation position on me uh, so that he would be in a position to maybe keep a better visual uh, access to my airplane as we descended through the weather. Uh, and then, um, you know, we kind of uh, kind of made a commitment to ourselves that we were going to put our wings on the glare shield and we were going to do what it took uh, to get the mission done. And uh, when I asked Billy Bob if he was ready to go, all I got from him was two. There was no question from him about what we were getting ready to do and what I was getting ready to lead us into. Uh, and, and, you know, that goes all the way back to that personal and professional relationship that Billy Bob described even before we ever went to war together. Billy Bob. No, you're absolutely right. I, I knew, well, if you weren't going to descend to the weather and help them, I was going. So, but I knew you were, and I, I knew that in order to maintain visual with you during that sandstorm, we were going to be close. And so I, as Donk was getting this information and, and, and talking to Coke as we're taking direct enemy tank fire and starting to process, hey, where do I descend? How do, where am I going to go? I'm closing the gap on the formation without even him having to tell me because of that combat pair and being instinctive to know what he's going to need from me. And, and there we went. I mean, he, he just said, are you ready to go? And looked over and saw me right there. And he knew, yeah, I'm right on your wing. Let's go, you know, and, and he rolled his airplane and we, we both kind of did a split S and just went straight for the ground. When you say rolled your airplane, just describe for the, you know, listeners what that means. Sure. I mean, we're, we're flying straight and level towards Baghdad and we're getting over the target area. And, and instead of, you know, doing a nice, easy descent that you would if you're in an airliner. I mean, we rolled the airplane upside down and pulled straight for the ground because we wanted to get down there as quickly as possible. Uh, we're probably descending at a 60 degree angle is what I'd guess somewhere that 45 to 60 degree angle. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting nauseous here. Uh, by the time we roll down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we got used you got used to it <laughs> yeah sure uh just just chunks all over the dashboard uh anyway um so when you get into the actual sandstorm are you is there a moment you're like oh this is a bad idea like how do you know how do you get yourself in your bearings of getting through that uh so uh the answer to that mark is just no i mean you know once once we made the commitment, and quite honestly, the commitment was instantaneous. I mean, we knew what we were going to do as soon as Pope said what he said. You know, I mean, and you know this from your own experience. You know, when when the when the radio starts chirping and you start hearing explosions in the background and you start to hear the you know staccato of squad automatic weapons and you know. It, you know, I, I've only experienced that through the radio and through AAA. I mean, you've lived it on the ground. You've already described it for us, what it feels like and how personal it is. When, when, when we knew that is what was happening, we didn't give it another thought. And, and then what happens is we became completely saturated for the next 45 minutes to an hour right. because the environment that we were operating in was so challenging. It didn't matter whether it was, you know, thunderstorms and sandstorms. Uh, it didn't matter whether we couldn't see the ground. You know, I know one of the things that was going through my mind was, you know, I was looking at my map as we were in the descent and I was trying to figure out, what were the height of the nearest towers that were in our vicinity? And I knew that they were in the neighborhood of about a thousand to 1250 feet or so. So I knew that I would be able to descend down uh, over comparatively flat terrain. Cause we get it. We know what Iraq is like in that particular area. It's flat. 
And I knew that I could descend down to at least 2,000 feet and not worry about hitting any obstructions. Sure. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of you kind of got to go, all right, Coke has helped build for me a mental picture of what Objective Monty looks like. However, I still haven't seen it. Right. So now, you know, what am I going to do when I get, when we break out of the weather? When Billy Bob and I come out of this 45 degree dive that we're in, how, how am I going to control the flight? You know, are we going to go sectors? Are we going to employ nighttime deconfliction tactics? You know, we've got to change our weapon switches from high altitude employment to low altitude employment. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on as we're descending, you know, that 16 or 15,000 feet or so uh, to try to break out from the weather. How and many then, seconds does it take to, to descend that quickly, just so everybody understands? Um, wow, that's a good question. I don't know. 45 seconds, maybe? Okay. I just want to know how much information you needed to process and how quickly you needed to do it. Would you say that's about right, Billy Bob, 45 to a minute? Or is that too yeah, small? Yeah, a good minute, maybe more. Yeah, it's yeah, probably maybe, a minute and maybe. a half. I mean, you go, you can go idle, full boards, full speed brakes, and that'll that'll create a bunch of drag and and help get your rate of descent pretty fast. But you know, if we're at twenty and yeah, it's it took probably a minute and a half. Still, I guess it's not a lot of time. I, the the point there. is, is that there's a lot of information to process, and it's not a whole lot of time to really do a lot of critical thinking to understand it, especially when once your head finally pops out of the, the weather and you can see the ground, you've got to spend a couple of split seconds orienting yourself to what you're actually looking at. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and so, yeah, so let's make sure that, you know, let's make sure I got that correction in there because I don't want to make it seem like it was too small time. I, let's go with about, let's go with about two minutes. That's probably about right, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, okay. So, I don't want to I don't want to bring Billy Bob into an environment that is going to be a lethal environment. So, you know, one of the two of us is going to have to, you know, kind of put it on the line at first. And so how do I how do I how do I preserve some mutual support between the fight? How do I give Billy Bob the opportunity to kind of be in a little bit of a uh, of a a sanctuary zone, if you will, um, where he's not quite as exposed to the threat as what he otherwise might be. And then to your point, Mark, how am I going to define, how am I going to find this target area? So if it's a clear in a million day and I'm operating at 20,000 feet and I've got my binoculars, I've already seen Objective Monty. I already know where the friendlies are. I already know where the enemy is. And I kind of know exactly how I can set this fight up um, to make it so that we're the most effective and lethal as we can be. Um, but when we break out of the weather uh, and, you know, there's, um, it, you know, the bottom of a sandstorm and a thunderstorm, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a solid overcast. You know, meaning that it can be ragged and at, at some points you can be at 3000 feet and maybe you can see the ground. Other times you got to be at 1500 feet to see the ground. It just kind of depends. But when we got down on the ground, I could not see the Tigris River and I could not see Objective Monty. I could not see the bridge. So what 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 we did was is we sectored uh, altitudes and geographic location in, in proximity to Objective Monty for deconfliction. And then I, I actually kind of went on the hunt. I kind of drove to the south of what I thought was uh, Objective Monty. I turned to the east. I found the Tigris River, and I flew northbound up the Tigris River, knowing that at some point in time, I was going to run into the bridge. Uh, and as it turned out, at what altitude uh, were you doing this? Huh? At what altitude were you when you started following the Tigris North? Uh, so I would say I probably, I was probably at about uh, maybe 2,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet, something low. like that. Still very low. 
Yeah. 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 Well, and let me tell you, that wasn't the lowest. If, uh, you know, <laughs> it, by the time we got back to Talil that night, which is a story in and of itself, if, if somebody had ever told me I was flying at 100 feet over downtown Baghdad, um, I wouldn't have believed it. But it happened that particular day. Um, and so once we got, you know, when I got into Objective Monty, you know, you know, of course, the whole time, you know, I'm talking to Coke. He's trying to update me on what he sees, uh, update me on the status of what's happening with friendly forces, what he sees happening with the enemy. Uh, I would say that the weather and Billy Bob, you got to check me on this because, you know, I don't want to make it too too demanding or, or too conservative. I would say the weather in vicinity of Objective Monty was probably about a thousand, you know, m- maybe, maybe 1200 feet overcast. And the visibility was about a mile to a mile and a quarter. Does that, is that about right? Is that what you recollect? Yeah. The, the ceiling was so variable at different places. It's, it's kind of hard to remember exactly what it was because it could be, like you said earlier, it could have been 4,000 feet. It could have been 5,000 feet. And then other places it drops down to 1,500. But throughout the entire sandstorm, the visibility definitely was a mile to a mile quarter at best. And and for your audience, Mark, to give a frame of reference, uh, the minimum that we could ever train to in an airplane uh, is three miles visibility. So all of our training, the minimum is three miles. And now we're operating at, uh, you know, 200 to 100 feet uh, with a mile to a mile and a quarter visibility in bad guy land. Who fires the first shot and when do you know to do it? So, um, so that's a great, that's a great question. So I'm talking to Coke. Uh, the first pass was strictly to identify objective mining. And ju- that first uh, pass I, was, was from the south going north over it, correct? That's, that's correct. And and we were, you know, you know, you made a great point earlier about when you mentioned, you know, kind of saving Private Ryan and that scenario of a bridge over a body of water, because until enemy and friendly forces mix it up on the bridge, you got you got really good demarcation of where the enemy is and right. where friendlies are. You know, and at that point in time, neither enemy nor um, friendly had started to come out onto the bridge. And so I asked Coke if I could have an immediate reattack with the intent that I was going to shoot two Willie Pete rockets, one on the south end of the eastern bridge abutment, one on the north end of the eastern bridge abutment. And what we were going to use those smokes for was kind of like a line of demarcation. All right. I understand that there's no friendlies that are to the east of that. There's no enemy to the west of that. And so we will use that as a line of deconfliction and we will keep all of our fires to the east of those two smokes. And he said, yes, that's fine. So I did an immediate reattack. Of course, I'm not going to do a 360 right there in the vicinity of the bridge. I kind of go back down to the south a couple of miles. I lose the bridge again, but I have the river. I fly up the river. I maneuver my airplane to expand the rockets probably at about a mile uh, because that's when I first begin to see what I think is the eastern bridge abutment. I hit the pickle button and nothing happens. Uh, And that is a notorious problem in the A-10 when you're shooting rockets uh, on the Lao 131 pod, uh, whether they're high explosive rockets or they're white phosphorus marking rounds, uh, those pods are not very reliable. <laughs> so I was unable to shoot my rockets. So I decided to overflow the Eastern Bridge abutment. I expended self-protection flares uh, over the Eastern Bridge abutment at about a hundred feet or so. And then I came back off with the intent that I was going to come back on my first hot run. So I actually made two runs into the target area before the third run, which is when I expended my first 
burst of 30 millimeter. Okay. And so, you know, the, you know, the, the problem with that is, is number one, because I haven't really figured out where everybody is yet. I, I am on a restricted attack axis in order to be able to control me and control my fires. Coke was compelled to ask me to fly from the South to the North up the Tigris river, uh, so that he, he could kind of channel where I was going right. and I could be predictable for him. Right. Um, but if I'm predictable for him, who else am I predictable for? I'm predictable for the enemy. And so at this point in time, the enemy knows I'm, I'm coming back around. And this time I've got intent uh, to expend ordnance. And that's when the AAA, the, the AAA started on the rocket run, but it really started to become kind of voluminous um, when I went in for my first straight pass. I followed the same profile. I saw an enemy BMP uh, that was approaching the Eastern Bridge abutment, moving to the West, looking as if it had the intent to cross. And I successfully strafed that vehicle. Uh, and then as I was coming off my strafe pass, uh, I got a flashing master caution light. My HUD started to blink in front of me. Uh, I looked down at my enunciator panel where all of my warning lights are. Uh, and all of my warning lights were on. The panel was completely illuminated or near completely illuminated. And at that point in time, as I pulled off an egress to the West, uh, I thought I'd been hit by AAA. Um, in reality, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened was, is I had a malfunction in my airplane. Uh, you know, you do the standard thing where you aviate and you navigate and you communicate. So. I was maintaining aircraft control. I was navigating away from the target area into an area that I thought would provide some sanctuary. And then I communicated with Billy Bob um, and with Coke. And then what happened is, is, you know, everything looked pretty good. You know, the throttles were responding. My hydraulics looked good. My gas looked good. My electrics looked good. And I was like, hmm. So I started punching off the master caution and I started kind of waiting for the airplane to just kind of settle down a little bit. And then um, in the end, what I discovered was, is the computer that helps us with our targeting solutions in terms of uh, crosswind corrections, in terms of slant range corrections, uh, bullet density drop and things like that, that computer was fried. And so I no longer had computer aiming uh, for for my airplane. And See, at that point in time, Mark, I, I'd like to turn it over to Billy Bob because there's a really good segue between the two of us there as I come off target and he comes in. Yeah, Billy Bob, I, I kind of wanted to get hey, more uh, experience going through it at the same time. Sure. Well, you know, being low altitude and in the, the decreased visibility there, we, we kind of separated. We did altitude and, and sector deconfliction tactics. So I wasn't visual with him at all. I was just maintaining radio mutual support. Um, I think another key piece to add is Coke's location. Coke was at the talk, which was set up about three miles west of the bridge. Um, and I think he was communicating with somebody at the lead element. So the relay for information back to Coke was critical to get to us as we were firing. Um, but I was I was south about three to seven miles, I think, was my hold orbit uh, as Donk was doing his first three attacks, uh, just trying to listen on the radio, build my own situational awareness. Uh, and then he comes off target. Um, he never elaborated that he had problems. Uh, he just cleared me in for my first attack. Um, I think the only the only thing he said was that either before or after my first attack, he had mentioned that he was now uh, in using the standby pipper. So at that point, he clears me in. And all I know is hit the lead vehicle east of the bridge. And so just like Donk did on his first pass, my entire SA situational awareness is just listening to the radio and building a picture in my mind. 
so I fly the Tigris, fly down the Tigris River, use, utilizing the GPS to give me a countdown. And the visibility gives you about enough reaction time to go, there's the bridge, there's the there's a lead vehicle. Oh, that's a tank, pipper on it, shoot. I shot about 150 rounds, pause, start my safe escape maneuver, and I see secondaries come from that tank. And so uh, I come off target to the west. And that's the first time that I'd saw the target area. And when I'm off target to the west is the first time I see the friendlies because I'm I'm about a 90 degree angle of bank pulling about four G's. And I look straight down as I overfly the lead element for 269 armor. And there's probably 10 Bradleys and 15 uh, Abrams sitting right there, all right at the uh, base of the bridge. And another key element to this is why are they not maneuvering and why are they not firing back? Well, the altitude at the end of the bridge is low. So they're kind of at a low point, whereas the T-72 up on the top of the bridge is shooting rounds right over the top of their head. So it's kind of got our guys pinned down. And like Donk said, they were in condition black because they had been fighting since three in the morning uh, all the way up to Bag, uh, all the way up to the north part of the Baghdad. And another uh, piece of information we forgot to mention was 269 Armor is now the lead most forward deployed U.S. coalition forces in Baghdad. So that, that's another key piece to the fight. But I come off target and um, I head up to the north because that's where Donk had sent me. And then he did his now fourth attack. And again, we still are building our target area situational awareness. So as I come back in for my second pass, I hit the same tank again because I, I really don't have another target. And as I come into the target area, I know that there's a target there and I try to find something to shift to, but I just don't have anything. And so in order to build my own uh, target area picture, instead of doing an immediate safe escape maneuver, I overfly the target and I just kind of roll up on my belly and look straight down. And that's when I see the second T-72 plus the AAA, plus several other uh, support vehicles in the roundabout area. And so I immediately tell Donk, hey, I've got a second T-72 uh, Eastern uh, position of the roundabout, and he clears me back in for an immediate reattack. And that's when I come in and hit the second T-72 and get a kill on that one. It's interesting. Uh, so just I'm understanding this that donk you made your first two or three passes and billy bob you're sort of waiting off a couple of miles in the distance waiting for him to finish before you go in it's not a rotational thing it's not donk billy bob donk billy bob back and forth yeah uh no it yeah kind of it kind of would be if it was daytime vfr and we can maintain we can maintain visual with the friendlies uh we can maintain tally on the target we can maintain visual between the formation. Well, yeah, we're rolling in every 30 seconds with guns on Got something it. and just, you know, picking them off. But because of the limited visibility and the fact that we had to kind of switch from a mid afternoon sortie to nighttime tactics and deconfliction measures, no, we weren't able to go in as quick or as, uh, or as efficiently as you would like to in a daytime sortie. No. Now, uh, Billy Bob, you actually get shot. Your, your aircraft gets hit during this, correct? Uh, I didn't get hit. My fourth pass. So first one, second one from the north, and then the third pass was from the south and egress to the north. And so it's on the fourth pass coming in from the north. So my second attack from the north, I'm at about uh, a mile and a half. I just get sight of the target area and I see a missile go right by my left wing at about 20 feet. I instinctively just put the stick in my lap, pull the airplane for all it's worth, uh, turn back towards the west, towards friendlies. Uh, and that was the first time that I saw Donk because I looked up and there he was about a uh, half mile away, a couple thousand feet above kind of trailing me and he goes hey are you all right and I was like yeah and I just continued my turn around 
and went back in. And that's when I actually hit four vehicles on the next pass that were on the uh, west side of the roundabout. They were kind of support vehicles. I, I, they, I think they were like trucks in, in uh, pickup truck kind of things, but they were all lined up together there. I don't know if uh, the AAA guys were using them or, or whatever, but they were targets. Uh, that was the next target I had, and I, I put 30 millimeter into those guys. So uh, how long does it take you to do one run, right? So I'm just trying to gauge the time for everybody. You know, you get in there, you do one run and turn around to come back for a second. How long does that take? I mean, we were talking about a minute, two minutes between time over the target. I'd say it took, uh, uh, it took a little bit longer than that because we, yeah. Again, we would egress, we would do our safe escape maneuver, and we would go out four to five miles to kind of to break away from the enemy, get rid of our sound, and then and then the next one would sneak back in. Plus, we had while we're while we're doing this, we would have to do a sector and altitude swap so the next guy could come in. You know, Donk would be above me. Uh, as I'm attacking, I come off target, I go the other sector, then we do our altitude swap then he clears in and that takes a little bit of a, uh, of some time. Um, so I would say three to four minutes between each pass. And, and you know, I'm just trying to gauge for the audience. So if you each did four passes, you're talking, you know, 30 minutes you hear, you know, 28, 30, 32 minutes, oh, whatever yeah. you want to say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think all, I think all totaled, you know, from the, from the time that we descended, you know, from altitude uh, until the time that we were egressing and climbing back up to altitude, that was easy an hour, easy. It could have been an hour and a half. Uh, the actual fighting portion where, you know, we were actually employing, uh, I would say that was in the neighborhood of about uh, 35 to 40 minutes or so. All totaled, and and there's a, there's there's a couple of things I want to describe too, to kind of uh, it's a, maybe a little bit of a better description because I failed to do it at the beginning. Was the first thing is is objective Monty when we talk about the Mufana Bridge, and you know I think we've kind of described you know that that environment pretty well. What I didn't describe was about. 500 meters east of the eastern bridge abutment. So we're talking enemy territory. There was a uh, roundabout. You know, it was it was part of an autobahn, part of a highway, uh, and that's the roundabout that Billy Bob is describing. And you know, one that became very central to him and me being able to describe for each other where subsequent targets would be. So, for example, you know, Billy Bob would run in on his attack, whether it be south to north or north to south. I would be holding in my sector. Maybe sometimes I could see him. More often than not, I couldn't, based on the weather. And he would describe for me what was happening on the ground as he was egressing. So as he was clearing his flight path, as he was looking back into the target area to actually do an assessment of his own battle damage and what kind of impact he had had on the ground, he would be able to pass, you know, an update to me with regard to additional vehicles. You know, were there additional armored personnel carriers? Were there additional tanks? Were there additional fuel trucks? Were there utility vehicles that were carrying ammunition or troops? And, and then that would better arm me with the latest update as we executed our role swap and I became the shooter and he was covered. And I think it's also important to know that the U.S. Marine Corps was approaching from the east. 
And what we didn't know was we didn't know how much their line of march was encroaching on objective Monty. So we didn't know if the Marines were 20 clicks to the east of objective Monty or whether they were three clicks to the east of objective Monty. And so that became a feature the longer that the engagement went on. Um, That was something that Billy Bob and I were thinking about and trying to get information on because we needed to have situational awareness about where the Marines were so that we didn't inadvertently get into a situation where maybe we mistook our own guys for the enemy. Because as the engagement progressed and as these, you know, battalion sized elements of what Subsequently, we knew was the Hammurabi Division, Special Republican Guards, as they were kind of moving out of Baghdad and moving to the northwest to affect their egress out to the west, as you described earlier, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, We didn't know whether what was coming up the road toward the roundabout from the southeast We didn't know if it was enemy or it was friendly. And that was one of the things that we had to determine before we could start to, you know, broaden our engagement zone, if you will, and start to attack additional targets that were to the east and the southeast of Objective Monty, obviously with the goal of, you know, stopping them in their tracks. And and as it turned out, we did get information about U.S. Marine Corps disposition, and they were not in close proximity to Objective Monty. So we knew that everything that was egressing Baghdad up the highway to the roundabout to turn left and then go through Objective Monty, we knew it was all enemy. Uh, And so instead of our engagement area being focused strictly on the bridge, we were able to, you know, broaden that out. Then we included the roundabout. Then we started to include the highway that was to the southeast of the roundabout, which they were trying to use to exfil Baghdad. And then the last thing that I want to describe for you, because I think it's important as, you know, you, you had the question about timing. Is there something that happens in the air um, maybe more specifically at nighttime, but it happens in, in the daytime as well. And it's a, it's a phenomenon called the mothball effect. And so what happens is, is, is when you get into a target-rich environment and you're actually in a scenario where you can, you can have the timing and tempo that's more rapid, as Billy Bob described earlier, there's a tendency for the flight to kind of mothball closer to the to the target area and that's part of the reason why you want to be disciplined about breaking contact and breaking line of sight with the target area so that you know you can try to come in from a different attack axis which obviously makes you less predictable for enemy gunners um but also you know to 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 kind of further complicate their targeting problem on you And so that's part of the reason why you have to kind of you have to kind of get out of the engagement zone for a little bit and then come back in, hopefully from a different axis of attack. How did you guys know when the attack portion of things were over? Was it because Coke told you were you running low on fuel? Like, how how do you know when it's time to to get out of Dodge? Uh, So that's a that's a great question. So, you know, um, There is something that we calculate before we ever take off, which is called bingo fuel. And bingo fuel is a fuel that we set that will allow us to prosecute in the target area for a certain amount of time, egress the target area, and then recover back to our uh, to a recovery base. Doesn't necessarily have to be where you took off from, but to a recovery base. Um, without the requirement for air-to-air refueling. And so Billy Bob and I had set a bingo to depart 
kind of Baghdad proper. Since you don't know exactly where you're going to fight, we just kind of took the center point of Baghdad and we said, okay, we'll, we may be fighting somewhere in proximity to this particular point. How much gas do we need to get back to Toledo? Because that was, we had two options at that point in time because Baghdad International wasn't open uh, for friendly force operations yet. We, we could go back to Talil or we could go back to Kuwait. Well, the whole, the whole reason why we forward deployed into Talil was to give us more time over the target area and to reduce our gas requirement, you know, kind of writ large in the theater. So we weren't going to compute a bingo to go back to Kuwait. We computed our bingo to come back to Talil. Well, we, we knew about halfway through this engagement, that we were not going to be able to do everything that we needed to do for Task Force 269 Armor uh, if we didn't stay in the target area longer. So we still had ammunition. We had not yet had the desired effect on the ground, you know, which was clearly to take the pressure off of our guys, give them the opportunity to resupply, and then give them the opportunity to go on the offensive, you know, with with their mechanized infantry, if you will. Um, so I asked Billy Bob if he would go off and he would find a tanker for us, you know, which meant that while we're fighting, while he's trying to deconflict, while he's trying to provide mutual support, while he's expending ordnance, I'm also asking him to go talk to the Air Support Operations Center on another frequency and see if he can get us a post strike tanker. Uh, and he did it took him about two and a half to three minutes to come back and say, okay, we got a post strike tanker. You know, they're going to meet us to the North Northeast of Baghdad. And, you know, there were some other particulars about it, but at that point in time, I knew we were going to have the opportunity for, to get gas. And so Billy Bob and I decided we were going to reduce our bingo fuel. And so I, I think we reduced our bingo fuel by about 400 to 500 pounds. That's about all I felt really comfortable with. And what we calculated was we calculated that would get us back to Talil with minimum fuel. And, you know, this is another one of those things where you start talking about, you know, rules of engagement and, and what are you willing, what kind of risk assessment are you willing to make? And Billy Bob and I collectively decided that we felt comfortable getting back to Talil with minimum fuel, which is about uh, 1,200 pounds of gas. Emergency fuel is 800 pounds of gas. So we felt like we had a little bit of slop to play with there. And that gave us more time in the target area, um, more, more opportunity to help Task Force 269 Armor. So we did that. Uh, and so... Everything in terms of the engagement was progressing well. We anticipated that there was going to be another set of fighters that was going to come on board and was going to replace us. Maybe we would have the opportunity to give them a target area handoff and kind of give them the benefit of everything that we learned uh, as we were in the target area. Or alternatively, it, it may fall to cope to, to have to do that just like he did with us. Just kind of depends on the timing of how things develop. So we actually were in a position at that point in time to start trying to attack some of the AAA batteries that have been shooting at us. Right. Part of the reason is because we wanted to prep the battlefield for the next set of fighters that was going to come on board. If we could reduce the volume of AAA in the target area for their benefit, that would be awesome. Not to mention the fact that, um, you know, and I, I don't say this with a lot of bravado, but you've had somebody for the last 35 or 40 minutes trying to kill you. Uh, it's, it's time for a little retribution uh, and to set the stage, you know, on the battlefield. Right. Uh, so, so that's what we did. Um, the ordinance that Billy Bob, both of us went Winchester, which means we both had zero rounds left in the gun. Uh, as Billy Bob described earlier, you kind of had on the jets what you had. Um, 
which was gas and bullets unless you were lucky. I had a Maverick missile uh, on my airplane and I was able to take out an enemy APC with my Maverick missile. Uh, and then after about 40 minutes or so, that's when Coke came up on the radio and he said, hey, he goes, uh, we got a really satisfied, you know, task force commander down here. We feel like you guys have taken the pressure off. We got another set of fighters that we anticipate is going to onboard, you know, what's your status? And at that point in time, you know, we were getting real close to our reset bingo. Uh, both of us were out of bullets. Uh, and I didn't have any more Mavericks. And so it was time for us to egress the target area. And so what I'd like to do, Mark, if if we could, I know that was a lot of talk in there. I want to give Billy Bob the opportunity to kind of chime in with his reflections on that. Yeah, of course, uh, Donk will hand it off to me right after he tells me about uh, my responsibility to get a tanker and then we come off target and that tanker is not there. It had left. And so just like he said, uh, we had dropped our bing our fuel bingo down to what we considered the minimal level that we could accept. Um, and now we're like, okay, no tanker. So we start our egress to the south and we're starting to depart Baghdad and we get up to, I want to say about uh, 10,000 feet and we're able to rejoin and get visual. Uh, he puts me into a, a line formation. I'm about uh, three, three quarters of a mile off his wingtip on the uh, right side. And he's climbing up and he's starting to communicate with the uh, ASOC and he's giving them our battle damage assessment and telling them that they're going to need new fighters in this uh, uh, target area. Uh, and about that time we're climbing through about 15,000 feet. Uh, and we're going to climb to we're our goal now, because we don't have a tanker is we're going to climb up as high as we can go. I think we went to about 25,000 feet. We're going to pull our throttles all the way back, but we're climbing through 15,000 feet line abreast and almost simultaneously he gets flack uh, to explode at all four corners around his airplane. So his forward left, forward right, rear left, rear right, almost simultaneously, four big clouds of anti-aircraft artillery uh, explosions uh, erupt. And he's, he's on the radio. He's probably heads down reading his notes, and I'm supposed to provide the mutual support for him. And typically you'd tell him, hey, break left or break right away from the threat. But at that point, I just got on the mic and I said, move, they're shooting at you. <laughs> and so I was going to uh, say, when he was looking at his notes, what did they read? Oh, shit. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, most of his notes would probably read that way, Mark, to be honest. But yeah, um, and he can describe he can describe the moment uh, that he felt at that point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, this is a this is a classic example of you know where where mutual support by a wingman that's that is doing his or her job, you know, makes all the difference in the world. So, you know, when I was heads down. I was trying to, you know, figure out a frequency or maybe get a target area coordinate or do something like that to pass on a certain level uh, of fidelity of information that could be passed to the next set of guys or gals. And uh, I heard Billy Bob say move and, and he said it in a very animated way. And I was like, holy crap. What am I going to do? And the reason why I reacted that way, uh, and, you know, of course, all this happens in nanoseconds, is because I have become inattentive to my energy state in the airplane. And so as we were climbing out, I allowed my nose to get a little bit higher than probably what I should have. You know, I was trading energy for altitude. Because I wanted to get up and I wanted to get out of the threat envelope 
uh, as rapidly as we could. And in the A-10, you know, it, it, we don't have a whole lot of energy to begin with. It's a very, um, it's a very finesse airplane to employ. Very, very easy airplane to fly. You know, take off and landings and that kind of stuff. Very easy to fly. But to employ that airplane in the combat environment takes a lot of finesse. And I was not being full of finesse as we climbed out of the target area. I became task saturated. I wasn't paying attention to my external environment. Uh, I heard Billy Bob say move. And I knew all I could do was just kind of roll over on my back and kind of split S. It's, it's really the only option that I had uh, because I didn't even have the energy to, to, to jink laterally. And so I did that. And I recall that as I pulled over on my back and I started to commence my split S, um, I looked back where my airplane was and I saw what I thought was another four round burst. And so, it, you know, the, the fact that Billy Bob had given me the direction to maneuver my airplane, zero doubt that he prevented battle damage, uh, highly likely that he prevented me having to bail out of the airplane. Uh, and then, you know, who knows, you take it down a different path where if they get lucky, you know, they kill me because I wasn't paying attention uh, to what I needed to do. And uh, so needless to say, you know, I paid attention to what was going on around me as we egressed out of Baghdad uh, for the remainder of that period of time. And then, you know, we climbed to altitude, like Billy Bob said, the A-10 is designed to operate. Uh, built to operate low altitude with those high bypass span engines those engines like thick air which exists at low altitude not at high altitude and so when you start talking about flying in the high 20s you're putting yourself in a situation where there's uh, there's more likelihood of a compressor stall if you manhandle the jet and of course that's the last thing that we wanted to have happen as we were trying to get back to Tlil. Uh, knowing that we didn't have a whole lot of gas to play with. Um, I, mean, and <laughs> I was going to say, uh, among the myriad of reasons I could never be a pilot, uh, you know, outside of just, you know, general nausea and, and inability to see straight and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, I could never be a pilot because I'm simply that guy who, when his car gas level gets down and the light goes on, like I just keep driving. Like I, I literally tempt fate every single time until I get <laughs> so low on gas that literally the car might stall out. And so I'm never built to be a pilot for that reason alone, because I would just keep flying until I ran out and hopefully just glide into a landing spot somewhere. Well, <laughs> well let, let me tell you what, Mark, we, we got closer than we wanted to get to that scenario. <laughs> so I, I'm going to, I, I Very would like, true. Uh, I'd like Billy Bob to, to kind of take over and have Billy Bob, you know, describe the rest of our recovery uh, into Toledo because that's a pretty interesting story on its own. Yeah, so to to give you a frame of reference for Toledo Air Force Base at that time, there was very little uh, infrastructure at all. As a matter of fact, the runway didn't have any lights. The control tower was operated by, I think, a couple of combat controllers. Um, you know, uh, it's just very basic uh, We'd only had airplanes on for uh, 48 hours. So um, we're about 100 miles out. We started our descent into Talil, and it's just a dark hole. There's nothing to see. And we're trying to find the airfield. And Donk's starting to uh, to head down the path. And we, could, we couldn't pick up the airfield. We, you know, we're five miles away. We can't see the airfield. We can't see the runway. Can't see nothing. And so we overfly the field, I want to say at about 1,500 feet, uh, using our GPS. And I'm in about a mile to two mile trail on Donk. Uh, and he can see the airfield. And so he pitches to the south to, to uh, fly a, a, a landing pattern. And as soon as he pitches away from the field, he loses it again. And so we end up pitching around. We're both now back to trying to point at the runway or what we think is the runway. 
I want to say Donk's at about a mile. I'm at about two and a half miles from the runway. And we're asking the tower, do you have anything, a flashlight, something to shine at us so we can get a frame of reference? And right about that time, there's a army helicopter uh, right at the approach end of the runway on the taxiway. And he's on the frequency. He's like, hey, would it help if I turned on one of my landing lights? And Donk goes, turn it on. <laughs> and it's, you know, as soon as he does, we're able to have a frame of reference and you can kind of make out the concrete. And we both, we both land from that sort from that, uh, sortie, uh, you know, at men fuel with no other real options, which was, uh, added an element to the mission that we weren't expecting because, um, and then, um, one of the, one of the very interesting things is as we taxi back, um, you know, the adrenaline had been running the entire time. And so we taxi back and we get in our parking spots. And when you shut down the A-10, you bring the throttles back to idle. And then you, what they call over the hump, you pull them up and then you pull them to cut off. And uh, so I raise my canopy, I get some fresh air. Crew chief gives me the signal to shut the engines off. And I pulled the throttles to idle and over the hump and shut them down. And at that time, you get the normal sound of the engines winding down. And so that event of pulling the engine over the hump to idle and, and cut off and uh, caused me to um, have an adrenaline rush uh, just release through my body. I can't describe it. I've never felt it before. I never felt it again. Um, and it was so intense that it was kind of an out of body experience, but the crew chief will come up the ladder and grab your flight bag and kit from you. And the crew chief runs up the ladder, looks at me and he goes, what the hell happened to you? And I just look at him and I go, I go, I just need to sit here for a little bit. I go, you need to check the airplane for battle damage. Uh, because I couldn't move. Uh, all the adrenaline from that mission was running out of my body and I just couldn't physically move for a little bit. And I had to gather my thoughts uh, after, and it was the whole, I mean, we, because we were just constantly staying engaged using every bit of our brain and our energy to stay focused on supporting the guys on the ground, getting back to the base, landing safely and getting out of the airplane that, that, that moment in time of shutting the engines off was kind of my, my way of telling myself that, okay, you can finally stop. And the adrenaline was insane. The amount that was just flowing through my body that I couldn't move for about five minutes. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, Mark Billy Bob characterizes that we landed with minimum fuel. I, I think that that is a, uh, I think that's a lie that we need to perpetuate for posterity so we don't get into trouble. Because uh, I know that neither of the two of us had minimum fuel when we landed. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, when uh, I think it was the CH 46 pilot um, that turned on his landing light. And when that light illuminated, you know, it was right in front of my airplane. So I was lined up on the parallel taxiway to the runway. I wasn't lined up on the runway. And I only had to do a small maneuver, you know, to get lined up on the runway. Um, and it was probably the worst landing that I ever executed. Because I damn near drove both of the main gear up through the top of the wings. That's how hard I landed on, you know, lack of depth perception and things like that. And and I I, I like to tell a story about our our maintenance production supervisor was a master sergeant uh, Michael Streeter, probably one of the best maintainers that I, I've ever met in my life, and I had three combat deployments with Master Sergeant Michael Streeter as our lead production supervisor. It was his flight line. They were his maintainers. They were his jets. 
and you had to ask permission to fly his airplanes. And in those three <clears throat> combat deployments, the Tiger Sharks flew over 18,000 combat hours. Wow. And we, we never missed a beat. We never missed a vulnerability period uh, with Master Sergeant Michael Streeter leading our maintenance team. We may have had some jets take off late, and we may have had some, you know, in-flight rejoins, uh, but we were always there. Three combat deployments, 18,000 combat hours, uh, and it was because of Master Sergeant Michael Streeter and, and his guys and gals uh, that, that prepared those jets for us. Um, and I can remember, you know, I took a little gruff uh, because both of both of my main landing gear, the tires, had to be changed after that sortie because I tore them up so bad when I landed. And I told Streeter, I said, listen, I don't feel bad at all about the fact that you and the guys have to change those two tires because on my second pass in the target area, when I tried to shoot two Willie Pete rockets and I hit the pickle button, nothing happened. So let's call it square. Yep. <laughs> I didn't get any rockets and you got to get two new tires. There you go. Oh yeah. You know? it sounds, sounds like an even deal one way or another. Uh, right. Let me ask you guys, you've had time obviously to go back and reflect on this. And you know, when, when you get away from it, you get a little bit more clarity, but whether it's tactically or just, you know, overall, would, was there anything you think you would have done different if you had to do it again? Uh, no, not, not for me. Um, no, as, as a matter of fact, uh, Mark, the, uh, the, the, uh, I, I'm almost hesitant to say this, but I'll, I'll say it. Um, the in-flight communication and execution between Billy Bob and I on that particular day uh, that was subsequently adopted um, as kind of um, a textbook example, if you will, of how you're supposed to, um, you know, execute a combined arms fight. Uh, that's close air support requires, you know, close integration uh, and was actually adopted by uh, Air Combat Command, you know, which is our major organized training and equip command in the Air Force uh, for their uh, cockpit resource management training. So it was mandatory uh, for every pilot in the Air Force that was required to take uh, CMR, uh, cockpit management resource training, to to listen to uh, vignettes of that particular day to kind of understand how two people that may not be able to see each other and may not be able to see the target area and are communicating with, you know, a ground liaison officer on behalf of a maneuver force commander, um, you know, some techniques about how you might do that. So I would say that, uh, you know, that was that particular sortie was uh, kind of the culmination of preparation meeting opportunity, if you will. I, I, I don't know if that's exactly the right way to characterize it. And quite honestly, I, I, I hesitate to characterize it that way. You you asked me, you know, would there be anything different? Um, we know. We know that guys died that particular day, and we know that we didn't bring everybody home. Um, and I know that that weighs uh, that weighs pretty heavy on me and Billy Bob. And you know, I'll, uh, I'll share something with you. You know, a couple of years later, the commander of Task Force Two Six Nine Armor was Lieutenant Colonel J R Sanderson, mm -hmm. and I had a buddy of mine, Spanky O'Dowd, that was going to senior service school at uh, the Air War College in Montgomery. And it just so happened that J.R. Sanderson was there at Air War College with my buddy Spanky. And at the time I was going to senior service school at uh, what's now called the Eisenhower School. It used to be called the Industrial College of the Armed Forces in DC. 
And then, you know, for the, for the senior service schools for each of the services, they convene once a year, you know, non COVID times at Carlisle Barracks, right? In Pennsylvania, where the Army's War College is. Yep. And, and they have Jim Thorpe days, right? It's, it's three or four days of athletics and competition and camaraderie. And it's just, it's pretty fantastic. And Spanky told me that JR was going to be at um, Jim Thorpe days at Carlisle Barracks. And so was I. And so I can remember being at Carlisle Barracks, waiting in the parking lot for the Air War College bus to come up. The door opens. Spanky, who is just a phenomenal individual, he comes bounding out the door. You know, he gives me a big old bear hug, which he's likely to do. Um, and then, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I see, I see Jr. come walking down the bus. And I'll tell you, dude, you know, the two of us just kind of collapsed into each other's arms and we just kind of hugged each other. It was the first time we'd ever met each other. Um, and we must have stayed there just kind of leaning into each other for about two and a half or three minutes and crying and just kind of reliving everything that happened that particular day. So, you know, you bring me back to if there was something that I could do different, that's what would be different. I'd find, I'd find ways to have better weapons employment. I'd find ways to have more gas. I'd find ways for us to have been able to be there faster. Uh, and, and those are the things I think I would change. Uh, and any, I mean, uh, unfortunately, none of those things are really in your control, and and um, that is the nature of combat, right? I mean, there's there's what you can't control and what you can't, and the outcomes are are unpredictable on on their on your best day. Even the best laid plans lead to unfavorable and unpredictable outcomes. So, um, well, I appreciate you sharing. You know, just uh, in in the big picture, it never hurts to be reminded. Um, that even though you carry that burden, it's not something that you alone have to carry, nor should you. Um, and that there are people out there who understand who carry similar burdens. And, and um, it's, it's something that we all have to sort of divvy the weight upon uh, for all of us, you know, so it's not just one of us feeling that way in, on, on any given day. Billy Bob, uh, you kind of expressed some of similar sentiments. Yeah, I mean, Donk just Donk summed it up very nicely. It's uh go back and dissect it all you want after the fact um, you have more situational awareness uh, but as you approach as you approach the scenario and you're flying it and you're, you're building your own picture and, and trying doing trying to do be as tactically proficient as possible saving the guys on the ground you know yeah you can go back just like donk said and yeah, I would have been more directive to the tanker and go, this is life or death. Stay there uh, with, all, you know, all with everything you can. I would have I would have had better uh, maybe maybe saved a few rounds to shoot one more target. Maybe um, I don't know. I don't know what what else uh, you could do in hindsight. But like you said, Mark, I think you summed it up very well. It's the fog of war. Uh you're building the picture as you go, and you hope you, you hope you did your absolute best for the guys on the ground. Now, both of you were uh, awarded the Silver Star for your efforts on that day. Uh, obviously, an incredible you know achievement and, and worthy of of what you guys accomplished in a short amount of time. And and, and although you you sit there and lament the ones you didn't say, but there are plenty more that that wouldn't have been spared had you not done what you had, guys had did. When do you find out about? the silver star and, and kind of take me through that whole story. Sure. Um, so it's, so it's uh, kind of funny. Um, you know, that night, Billy Bob, you know, the, the, the crew van comes and picks us up and we're on our way back. And, you know, we, we realized that, um, that sortie was a sortie of significance. Um, but we didn't know how significant it was. Um, you know, we kind of come full circle on this discussion about rules of engagement and commander's guidance and intent and finding ways to say yes, because somebody's life depends on what you do 
And we thought to ourselves that we needed to document everything that happened uh, as part of our in-flight report and make our in-flight report as detailed as we possibly could, excuse me, and then send that back to our squadron commander, Bino. So Bino was back in Kuwait with the majority of the squadron where while Billy Bob and, and, and me and several of our teammates were forwarded to Leal. So we had, we felt like we had to get that information back to Bino because there would be somebody who was going to get on the radio and was going to start looking for information about these two A-10s that had been flying over Baghdad at a hundred feet uh, during this engagement. So we did that. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, subsequently, um, that in-flight report and the documentation that we put together that particular evening is, you know, kind of what was used as the justification and the narrative uh, for the for for my decoration and for Billy Bob's decoration. And, and, and interestingly enough, um, I was submitted for the Silver Star and. Billy Bob was submitted for the Distinguished Flying Cross with Valor. And um, there, there are, I believe that there are probably a, a variety of reasons for why um, our, our leadership at the squadron and wing level decided uh, to submit us for those particular decorations. Um, and those are the way that our decorations were approved. Um, so as they go through the process of being endorsed at the squadron level and at the group level and then at the wing level and then off to, you know, U.S. Air Force Central Forces Command, uh, who's responsible for the air war at the time in Iraq. Uh, they were they were approved as written. And then what I'd like to do is I'd kind of like to turn it over to Billy Bob because this will this will resonate with you because I know you're familiar that subsequently there was a point in time when the Department of Defense ordered a review of all their decorations for valor. Uh, and that's this is where I want to turn it over to Billy Bob. Well, the way I remember it is we both were submitted for silver stars. Uh, but mine got downgraded to a Distinguished Flying Cross with Valor. Um, and so that's what I was awarded. And and then in uh, I had retired in 2015 and I was, uh, I fly for a commercial airline and I was getting ready to go to work. It was a Wednesday and I get a phone call in the morning and uh, the phone the phone call started with, is this a uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Greg Thornton? I go, yes. He goes, um, well, this is the uh, aide to the uh, ACC commander. And uh, it was General Carlisle at the time and said, General Carlisle would like to talk to you. When can we, uh, we'd like to get, make a phone call with you later on this afternoon. When would that be available? And I'm like, a four star wants to talk to me. I'm retired. He goes, well, <laughs> don't worry. It'll be good news. At least I'm not in and trouble. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't know. Maybe, maybe I was, and I didn't know what it. You got yet. me now, there, four star um, guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured if if he, it's about time they finally asked for my opinion. But it, you know, I had already retired. Um. So I I actually started driving to work, and I'm just about to pull into Denver Airport, and the phone rings, and so I pull off on the side of the road, and he goes. Uh, Billy Bob? I go, yes, sir. He goes, this is General Carlisle. I'm like, yes. He goes, well, we just wanted to make you aware of before it gets announced in the media tomorrow that we're going to upgrade your Distinguished Flying Cross with Valor to Silver Star. And I said, I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and it was just, uh, it, it was, uh, it was surreal. Wow. So yeah, that's just, like Donk said, it was a uh, it was a I believe a congressional mandated review, and I think they upgraded out of two hundred plus. They upgraded eight or nine. Uh, so some guys to silver stars. I think 
there might have been an Air Force cross or two in that. But uh, yeah, I was I was very humbled. And then we uh, it, the other funny part of that was uh, a buddy of mine who was the group commander at the Flying Tigers, which was now at Moody instead of Pope Air Force Base. Um, he actually gets my citation, my my award and my medal. And we go me and Donk actually meet up at the Flying Tiger reunion there at Moody and we run into him and he hands me my medal and he goes, here you go. And it's in, you know, in a plastic bag. And I go, Hey, that's great. That's all I needed. And all my buddies and Donk also said, uh, Nope, you know, you're not getting out that easy. Uh, you're going to have a ceremony. And so, and, and rightfully so in hindsight, I could have, they could have just given me it and I'd have been happy, but it wasn't about me. It was about, it was about my family. Uh, and, and in hindsight, I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy because when I got my DFC with Valor, even though it was in front of all the A-10 guys there at Tucson and my peers and, and all that, and the A-10 community gets to see that, uh, the upgrade at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, uh, with my family there is uh, just a great memory that, they'll, that we all get to share, uh, you know, and, and it gets to reward my wife and my family my kids and my dad and my mom and my extended family for all the support that they did and, and really kind of get to see me because, you know, your extended family don't, they always get to hear about everything you do in the military, but they don't get to see the, see the ceremonies all the time. Uh, you know, they see the retirement ceremony for sure. And, and, but this, this was special that, uh, they got to witness that, um, and they got to meet Donk. Donk was there, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, General Holmes, ACC commander, presented me with the medal. And because Corona was going on at the time, the other funny thing is this: I get notified at noon that, hey, the chief of staff and the secretary of Air Force are going to be at your ceremony today. And I'm like, uh, really? <laughs> OK, I better go write a speech <laughs> or something. So, yeah. So, yeah, I got to stress for about four or five hours and, and before that. But, uh, yeah, it was very humbling to have the chief there and the secretary of the Air Force. And uh, one thing that I wish I would have done better uh, and Donk, Donk really talked about it in the mission uh, is the secretary of the Air Force during my medal ceremony came up to me and, and she asked what makes the flying tigers so special. And I, you know, during that ceremony, I was, I was just kind of in awe of all the pomp and circumstance that everyone's showing me. And I got my family there. So I'm worried and stressed about them. And I didn't get to answer that question to her like I would. And I would have told her about how special it is to be in a, in a unit that has such rich heritage that the Flying Tigers have. And Donk and I had the privilege of meeting Tex Hill, Johnny Allison, and several others of the legacy Flying Tigers that flew for uh, General Claire Chennault in China. And, and, and we shared, you know, great memories with them. But we stood on... Uh, we stood there today and, and, and really it's because of them. It's because of what they did. And now we get to kind of put another mark in history for the flying tigers. But the whole point is that that unit has such rich heritage and everyone wants to perform at their best because not just for themselves, but because of the team and not to let down any, any of the past history of the Flying Tigers. And that, that's the most important thing. And so when we talked a lot about the team and, and that squadron and, and Colonel Turner Bino standing up in front of us a couple of weeks before the fighting starts and says, hey, you know, this is serious, this is real, everybody be on their A game. Well, honestly, he didn't need to say that because that's what the Flying Tigers do. And that squadron, the 75th fire, Fighter Squadron, that's what makes them special. They will perform uh, to their ultimate best and, and because of the rich heritage of that squadron. 
Good stuff. I'll, I'll close out on this uh, final thought with you guys. You've known each other for 20 years. Uh, you've obviously served through some of the toughest, you know, ordeals in combat together and managed to still maintain a, a, a level of friendship. I assume that, you know, uh, keeps you guys close after all this time. Uh, give me from each of you, give me one or two words or sentences about the other that, you know, uh, sort of not only encapsulates their, their skills as a pilot, but uh, their qualities as a friend. Mm. That's a, that's a good question, Mark. Dan, you're going to make me actually think a little bit here. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the character attributes that uh, Billy Bob um, personifies is loyalty. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not only, it's not only personal loyalty, but it's the, it's the loyalty to the team, regardless of rank, regardless of position. Uh, he, he is, he is exceptionally loyal. He's also exceptionally respectful. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, regardless uh, of rank or, or stature in the squadron. Um, everybody is a professional. Everybody gets treated that way. Everybody is treated with res dignity and respect. Um, and, and it is reciprocated uh, by virtue of his example. And I've seen it um, scores of times where based on the fact that it's Billy Bob, that is providing the inspiration, you know, whether it's through his action or through his word, because it's him and because he carries the, the personal and the professional gravitas that he does, um, people are inspired to move mountains for him. Um, so I, I think those are those are two attributes. I, I, I guess I guess there's loyalty, the fact that when you're around him, you are treated with dignity and respect, and the fact that when you're around him, you are inspired to be better than what you are normally capable of. You 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 are capable of moving mountains. Um, as an aviator. Um, I think I think loyalty bleeds over into into that as well. And I mean, what do you say? What do you say about a guy that you actually can say, you know, you trust your you trust your life to? Uh, and you know, that's not just me. I mean, that's that's Teresa. That's our kids. You know, to this day, that's that's. You know, it's my grandkids. I would trust Billy Bob with everything. Um, and we wouldn't even have to talk about what my expectations would be because he's he's such an exceptional friend. He already knows. And, you know, I don't I don't want to get all emotional here. So I'll just I'll knock it off there. I'll just say I love the dude. Well, that's a first. You didn't cry. <laughs> so that's what I'll say about him. He has unconditional love for everyone. Uh, and, and everyone that knows Donk knows um, he is an emotional guy and he'll show it. Uh, and at first, you're kind of like, what is he doing? But then when you get to know him, you're like, that dude is genuine. You know, he is he is a perfectionist. Um, the other thing I would say about him is accountability. Um, he expects it from you and he'll give it in return. Um, and that's what makes it, it made it so much fun to work for him. Uh, he pushed you to your limit and then some, and then when you fail, he gives you a big bear hug and he says, I knew you would get up. You ain't hurt and keep going. Um, and then, you know, leadership is definitely, he personifies leadership. Um, I, I don't think there's anyone that's ever 
been around Donk, worked for Donk, that wouldn't do anything for that guy. Um, he inspires you. Uh, again, he expects you to perform at your best and he'll hold you accountable to that. And like I said, he, he loves you either way. And from a pilot perspective, uh, you know, I don't know how we got picked as combat pairs. I think him and the commander were kind of doing that. So, um, but I feel very fortunate. Uh, he taught me so much about preparedness. Uh, a lot of the success of that mission was, again, our relationship over time. But it also, even, even during, from night one until 6 April, you know, we sat CSAR alert one day. And I remember, you know, I'm like, hey, great, I can sit CSAR alert. I'll get the airplane ready. I'll get all my gear ready. And then I can kind of take a break maybe and relax for a little bit in case they, in case they call us. And he goes, hey, let's sit down and talk about what we would do in an emergency or if we had this situation and we just kept pushing each other and that developed that, that commonality that we shared as a combat pair, that intuition that we, that we knew what each other was thinking because we, we practiced it the whole time. We flew together. We sat on the ground and chair flew together. Um, and that, that's, that's just who Donk is. He's going to push you. Uh, and he's going to make you better in everything you, you do. And I, same thing. I trust him and, uh, I love that guy. He's awesome. Well, obviously, you know, I mean, it's, it's clear the professional respect, but you know, the, the, uh, mutual admiration for each other. And I think you talk, you use the word genuine and that's really kind of what comes across, uh, and hearing you two speak about each other and the relationship and, um, again, it, that extends beyond the Air Force and beyond being pilots, and uh, it goes well into your personal lives and families and everything else. And I think that that is something that really, um, you know, anybody who's been in the military long enough knows when you have that 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 battle buddy that you're with for that long, um, it's 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 unbreakable as the bond. And so, um, you know, it's just great to it's great to see that you guys, after all these years, are still uh, playing wingman for each other, and and that that comes across for those who are watching on the screen, those who are listening that comes across uh, with, without a doubt. And, and I just want to thank you both for, for being so honest and sharing a little bit of emotion, but you know, your own stories and your own uh, personal, you know, uh, feelings on a variety of different topics. I think we hit a lot of different things here and uh, certainly reliving those moments in Iraq in, in 2003 um, kind of just, you know, uh, hammers home how, how important, you know, that, that whole phase of, of the war on terror was. And, and regardless of whatever your feelings are on, the decisions to, to go to war, you know, uh, what we did and what you guys did um, in the air and on the ground there certainly uh, saved lives and changed lives. And so, again, I appreciate you guys sharing all that with us. And certainly thank you guys so much for being part of the show this week. Thanks, Mark. Really, really appreciate the opportunity. And, and thanks very much to Courtney and her team for supporting uh, us in this way. And thanks to to Matt and Billy Bob, I love you, brother. I love you too, Donk. And uh, just to the entire Hazard Ground team, you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Thanks for having us. No problem. Donk, Billy Bob, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.